quickly. Oh, Sorry. Right. Thank you, much appreciated. Uh, yeah, so welcome everyone. Much uh, appreciated, Mohammed, for that introduction. I think that was a beautiful introduction, actually, because yeah, the main the main goal of this workshop really is to is to give you your time back. Um, I know as an analyst, it can be really um, frustrating when there's so much work that you want to do and could be done, but you just don't have the time to do it because you have to like regular reports and things that are coming through that you kind of just have to invest time in when maybe it's not really necessary to, or like I said, because you'd rather be doing other things. Um, so yeah, with that in mind, uh, I'll just quickly introduce myself. Uh, so my name is Hansel Palencia. Um, I'm currently a senior information analyst with um, the Devon Partnership Trust in, in Devon, uh, which is a mental health trust. Uh, good morning, Judy. Uh, and yeah, so this is, like Mohammed said, uh, this is the first time that we're offering this workshop. So uh, keep that in mind. And I apologize for any typos or errors that you might see. Um, <clears throat> and this is also the first time that I've ever given a workshop. So um, maybe double bear with me then. Um, I hope you have mercy uh, <laughs> uh, as well. So with that in mind, I have a very kind of short slideshow introduction into our markdown that we're just going to kind of briefly go over. And once we've done that, we will kind of jump straight in and we'll kind of talk about all of the really cool stuff that our markdown can do. And hopefully by the end of the, the, the day today, you'll have a really good tool set to be able to automate reports in our markdown and do some, some really cool stuff that is both uh, really beautiful in the sense that, you know, the report that you're creating is, is visually appealing um, and also uh, super efficient. So you can kind of create a, a, a framework or a mold that fits a lot of the reporting that you might be doing. Uh, so yeah, let's get started. Let me share my screen. Um, and then this here. Okay, yeah, intro to our markdown, NHSR Conference 2021. Welcome everyone again. Um, so this is kind of the, the workshop plan. So the first thing that we're gonna do is kind of talk about the expectations um, and that's your expectations and kind of my expectations as well. Um, after which we'll kind of uh, delve into like the background of our markdown. There's not too much here, um, really just kind of what it is and et cetera. And then we'll kind of talk about some of the uses and we'll quickly go over kind of two examples of stuff that I've done recently to kind of enhance my reporting suite. Uh, once we've done that, we'll talk about some of the functionality of our markdown, and that'll essentially be in, in three different parts, uh, which will be, first of all, the YAML, which stands for yet another markdown language. We'll talk about the markdown language itself. So in the, in, in the R markdown reporting, so how we actually like write commentary, um, headers, things like that. Uh, and then finally, we'll kind of talk about the coding aspect of our markdown. Um, and we'll kind of touch that when we get there. Welcome, Chris. Thank you for joining. Uh, this is Chris, everyone. Um, he's acting as my assistant today, though arguably I should be his assistant. Um, he's amazing. Uh, yeah, so after which we, after we talk about the functionality bit, um, we're going to go a bit into parameterization. So there's a really cool uh, functionality aspect of our markdown where we can do something called parameterized reports. So we'll touch on that a little bit and talk about um, how that's really cool and, and, and kind of ways that can enhance our reporting suite. After which uh, we'll talk about some R markdown automation. So where we can get to the point where it's like a one click and done type thing, which I think is uh, in my mind where we all want to be um, in, in our reporting suites. And if we can build kind of these automated reports where we just have to kind of either open a file and click something or just a quick kind of shortcut key and it runs all of the reports um, for the week or for whatever for the day um, that'd be you know amazing <clears throat> and then at the end we'll do a quick functionality demo where we'll kind of introduce some of the maybe the cooler aspects of our markdown some of the things that we maybe didn't talk about here um, I know it, we've talked about kind of within ourselves in the future maybe in advanced our markdown uh, workshop um, but that would be kind of in the future so uh, yeah, with that, let's get started. So our expectations. So I have four questions here. Uh, what is your current experience in R? 
Uh, what is your current experience with R Markdown? What do you want to take away from this workshop? And what is the usual tool set you use for reporting? So if you guys just want to kind of like answer those questions in the chat, that would be really useful for me so I can get an idea of kind of our cohort and where we're comfortable with, what we're not comfortable with. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so if you guys do that quickly, that'd be amazing. I'm just looking for the chat here. If I'm sharing, can I see the chat? Oh, it's a cat. It's right here. Okay. <clears throat> Morning, Wayne. Morning, Joe. Novice experience. Great. Uh, usually Word and Excel. Want to use RMD, intermediate R. Amazing. Ad hoc trained via Google. Amazing. The Google um, workshops are really, really good. Um, some exposure to R Markdown. Awesome. Current experience R Mark learned about a few weeks ago. Amazing, Susan. R intermediate, RMD beginner takeaway, better understanding of RMD reporting, uh, Power BI Shiny. We won't go into Power BI and Shiny today, um, but I know there are other workshops that are going into Power BI or Shiny, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, Chris or Mohammed, but we won't be doing too much of that today. Uh, but we will, yeah, like I said, go into kind of uh, automation of R Markdown. Yeah, so. sorry, can I just throw in? So yeah, there is a Shiny workshop running uh, by me, in fact. Uh, yeah, I yeah. think, is it two weeks? I'm sure it's fully booked by now, but there'll be others. So if you make a lot of noise in the community, then I'm sure we can put another one on. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. Uh, have used R and have run others R Markdown. High experience in R, fairly new to R Markdown. Morning on, very new to both R and R Markdown. Take away from the workshop everything you spoke of. Amazing, Susan. Uh, R one month, R Markdown zero. Amazing. Want to learn Markdown as we're transitioning to it for reports. I'm using Excel for reports. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Uh, R script still learning, never used, etc. <clears throat> so it looks like everybody has some, at least um, some introductory experience with R, which is really, really good. It means we can comfortably, hopefully talk about some of the concepts here uh, without any um, issues. But of course, if there are questions, I would really, really, really encourage you to ask them. Um, so to kind of a little bit more about me, um, I've uh, learned, I, well, let's see, I learned R maybe uh, four years ago. Um, and when I was first starting out coding, um, I was really, really lost for a long time because I just didn't ask any questions. And then I started realizing that the people around me were learning a lot faster than I was. And that's because they were really putting in the effort to really understand what was happening. And I was kind of just like following along. So if you are confused about something or you don't understand something, please, 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 just pop a question in the chat. I'm really going to try to be as attentive as possible um, to, to, to be able to follow along. And, and Chris, if you see anything that I've missed, um, feel free to just uh, let me know and I can kind of um, talk about it. And just really, we're here to kind of learn together. If there's something that you've done that I haven't talked about here and you want to just mention it because you think it's a really cool tidbit, please do. Um, this is this isn't a this isn't a lecture. It's a workshop. So I'm kind of talking about my expectations now. Um, so this isn't a lecture. It's a workshop. So I really want everybody to really try their best to participate um, and to maybe you know just ask a lot of questions and, and be as 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 uh, interactive as possible. Chris just um, added the Slack link to the channel. So the Slack is our NHSR Slack um, channel, which is where a lot of people go and they ask questions. Um, ask for for help or just announcements or just kind of general information. There's some job postings there if anybody's kind of looking to to pivot into more of a data science type role. Um, so yeah, really cool stuff. I would definitely recommend joining that Slack channel um, and keeping up to date on all the NHSR stuff. Well, cool. I think that's most of the admin kind of information. Um, yeah. Does anybody have any questions up to this point? Uh, Hansel, uh, this is a great start, by the way. I'd be really keen to know what people are using currently for reporting, just to have a sense. That would be just useful from my personal point of view. Yeah, so I think we got a lot of people saying that they use Excel, um, some SPSS. Um, Power BI and Shiny, yeah, okay. Power BI and Shiny, oh, okay. wow, that's really good. Um, uh, yeah, so I think most people are Excel, Power BI, Shiny type thing. Um, uh, 
yeah, uh, SQL, Excel, SPSS, Stata. Oh, wow. Cool. I actually don't know Stata. I've always wanted to learn because I was like trained by statisticians and they all know Stata. So uh, anyways, cool. So yeah, let's get started. Yeah. So <clears throat> what is our markdown? So our markdown um, and along with, you know, many, many other packages, they facilitate the development and production of, of highly versatile reports. And that's a really convoluted way of saying that our markdown is a package that lets you do really cool things really simply um, and then show other people those really cool things. Um, and so we'll talk about all of those cool things here in a second, but um, to kind of put it, you know, in a kind of simpler format, you know, why is this useful? Well, the beauty of our markdown comes from the ability for an analyst to organize their code into an easy to read and reproducible report. I'm actually using the wrong slide. Okay, hold on. Everybody bear with me. I'm using the wrong slideshow. Apologies. That's my old one. This is the updated one. I was like, I could have sworn there was something else there. <clears throat> yeah, so like I said, in the simplest form, it's it's our markdown can be seen like as a type of notebook. So I don't know if you guys have ever heard of like Jupyter notebooks. Um, and there are like lots of other type notebook. There's like a... Um, Ruby notebooks and stuff like that. So in simplest, our markdown can be seen like a type of notebook where an analyst can create reproducible and accurate kind of historical coding records. Um, and what I mean by that is you can like write reports, you can maybe like even write documentation about like some sort of work that's been done. Um, so it's just a place where you can go and you can say, this is, uh, this is a report and this is how it works step by step because kind of just how our markdown works logically is it's sequential. So everything from the top has to happen first for everything at the bottom to happen. So it becomes really useful when you're trying to like show the process of something or, you know, and we'll kind of talk about that when we, when we get there again. I know we're saying that a lot, but we'll get there, I promise. Um, so again, why is this useful? It, you know, allows for us to create these easy to read and reproduce with reports. And in our world, right? being able to create reproducible reports is super, super important, right? You have a team of say, uh, like my team, I think is like 10, 12 people, which is a relatively large team. And so if I have done some work and I need to, and I'm going on holiday for the week, uh, somebody else needs to run my reports for the week. And so if I have done like an Excel sheet and they have to look through the documentation uh, and sometimes the documentation can be really confusing or it can be outdated and I just haven't had time to update it, things have changed requirements have changed, et cetera. But if I have my work and say, in our markdown report, what can happen is they just open up the thing. Um, if I've set certain things up already, then they can just kind of do a quick, uh, like generate the report type thing. Uh, it spits out the report and they just have to send out the email, which in my mind is a lot better, right? And then, and if we already know what we're doing in terms of, I guess, the reporting that we're doing, um, obviously, it should be even, even easier to do our, our reporting suite, right? So <clears throat> to give you kind of an idea of, it, in, in my life, how this has been useful. So I started with the NHS um, a short, uh, almost eight months ago now. And when I started, uh, my role was, um, I was contracted part-time 20 hours a week. And uh, I had mm, seven, eight things in kind of my reporting suite that I pulled that I kind of picked up from the previous uh, person in my post, basically. Uh, so when I entered, uh, I was like, well, this is like this Excel kind of report is like really, really simple. I could kind of automate that. And so I kind of went into this process of automating all these reports using our markdown and something that took, uh, I think it was around 10 hours to do during the kind of the, the extent of the week, which is half of my half of what I was contracted to do ended up taking of uh, 20 to 30 minutes to run everything. So I saved nine and a half hours. And with that extra nine and a half hours, I was able to build uh, different kind of uh, modeling tools for the service that I was attached to, which we'll kind of show here. And it's the data that we're going to be using today is the, the data that I use to create that, that model for, for the service. Um, so yeah, essentially, if you kind of really pay attention, that's why I'm really uh, just encouraging everybody to ask as many questions as to and to clarify as much as you need, because if you learn what I'm about to teach you in this course, there's a really, really large possibility that you can save a lot of time, uh, which is gonna be amazing for you 
and you know you can pass it on to your team everything here is open source everything here is completely free um, and we're gonna you know it's being recorded right now we're gonna post it on uh, wherever we're gonna post it i think youtube and you know everybody can come and look at it and it's gonna be really really good so this is two examples of some reports um, that that i've done recently um, uh, in our markdown so the left one is a police and ambulance referral report um, and it kind of just is like police and ambulance referrals for a given week type thing. None of this data is real, by the way, I kind of just populated it with random stuff. Um, uh, but yeah, so that's kind of an example. The left side on the right side is kind of more of a bespoke analysis that I did. Um, but again, I did that in our markdown and, and it, was, it was really good experience doing it, both of these things. Um, would you guys like to see, um, would you guys like to see like the actual reports for these because they are on the the um the the space or should we just kind of move on and get into like the actual thing or would you like a slight demo or like example of what it can look like i'll wait until somebody answers i i'm gonna vote demo you're gonna vote demo okay yeah let's look at a quick demo um, well, not so much a demo, more an example, really. So I'll open this up in our web browser. <clears throat> so this is a discrete event simulation model that I built for um, the first response service in Devon. So the first response service is like a, like a, a call center, basically, where people who are having mental health crisis can call. And so you can see we have kind of a lot of uh, functionality here, right? We have kind of like this really nice table of contents where we can go down and kind of look at stuff. And that's really cool. And it kind of floats on the screen. We have like a really clean kind of just background in general. We have these like really nice um, kind of interactive graphics that we can see here. Um, so some of this we're gonna cover and some of it we're kind of just gonna demo it kind of towards the end. Um, hopefully if we have like enough time, but yeah, so this is just kind of an example of what a report looks like, you know, if, if once you, once you complete it, it can look really clean, uh, really kind of straightforward and you can see like graphics and stuff. And we have like tables and uh, just a lot of commentary and description. We have some like bullet points. It's like, a, it's kind of like, yeah, just creating a, a regular report, like you would say in word, but just with, with our markdown. Um, and it's in my opinion, a lot cleaner and a lot easier to follow um let's look at another one this is that police and ambulance uh referrals uh so we see here we have like this really clean like flex table this is a package called flex table that we're not going to cover unfortunately in this uh in this course but just kind of in case anybody wants to look at it let me just uh flex table And then we have kind of like this tabular, uh, there's tab for um, functionality here that we're also gonna, we're gonna talk about today, which is really cool. Um, so yeah, um, like Mohammed said, this is an HTML output and we'll talk about that here in a second once we get to kind of the outputs and stuff like that. But this is called an HTML output. And like Mohammed correctly said, uh, whenever this report is run, it generates an HTML file, which is hosted on, on a web browser. So if you send it to someone else, it doesn't open like an Excel sheet. It doesn't open a Word document. It actually opens up like a tab on your web browser, which is really cool because you don't actually have to like need like any kind of outside resources really to do something like, to, I guess, to send it off. Um, and then you can kind of, uh, yeah, you can host these reports on a server if your team is kind of that advanced or you can uh, kind of just send it as a one-off. I know Susan uh, just said, um, uh, that her work tends to be one-offs and ad hocs rather than regular reports. And that's completely okay as well. Uh, you know, like if you're using HTML or, or even if you choose one of the other output formats, you can kind of just send it off as a one-off and it doesn't have to be a regular report. Um, but we're going to talk a lot about uh, automation at kind of like the end of the day, um, just because I think that's for, for the majority of people, that's kind of where we want to be at. Um, Tina asks, how do you disseminate your markdown reports to not our users in an email? So once this report is generated, uh, you can just pop this into an email as an attachment and just send it off and it'll just open in their web browser, uh, which is really nice. I have had an experience, this may be a possible issue in case anybody wants to 
uh, do something like this. If somebody's using like Internet Explorer and they try to open an HTML file, um, it tends not to work. So I would suggest like Google Chrome, and Firefox, um, one of the more uh, updated uh, web browsers. But yeah, so cool. So that's kind of like a quick example, quick five minute example about uh, some of the possible outputs that you can have from our markdown. Cool. How are we doing? Is everybody following pretty well? We're about to start getting into the actual creation. Is that all right? Is there any more questions before we move on? I got a thumbs up from Victoria. All good from J Susan. Okay. All good from Jamie. Awesome. Thank you. So <clears throat> yeah, let's get started. So creating a report. So is everybody on the RStudio cloud? Um, uh, kind of thing. So this is what RStudio cloud looks like. Um, so to get here, if you open up the link, right? So we have some people, we have like, uh, Tina's created one, Wayne's created a default project. So if you open up our studio cloud, you should have been emailed a link to this kind of space. And then you come up here to new project and you just click new our studio project. That'll open up, um, a new project for you. And you can follow along with everything that I'm about to do. Um, does anybody... I'll, I'll probably just wait a second and see if anybody has any questions about that. Uh, if everybody starts kind of making up, making their projects quickly, um, that'd be great. And then here in maybe two, three minutes, we can, yes, can we get the link here, please? I, I'm pretty sure this is the link. Hopefully I'm right. Somebody let me know if it's not. Yes, so Chris just mentioned that um, for random interest, you can also host our Markdown on a Shiny server or our Studio Connect or standard web server for that matter. So yeah, so if you say have like a regular report that um, that's more maybe like dashboardy than an actual kind of like report. So you saw that that report that I had was kind of like, you know, this is like a report about discrete event simulation and blah, 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 so on and so forth. Um, what is Shiny? Uh, that's a good question. So let me just finish this and I'll answer that uh, for you, Victoria. So, um, so yeah, if you have like kind of more of like a dashboard instead of like, which you can create with our markdown instead of like a more of a sequential type report, then you can host that onto um, like a server, whether it be like um, Chris said, like a shiny server, RCU connect or a web server. And you can say like, give it like live updates. So you can have kind of like a live dashboard, if you will. Or you can, if you just want to have like all of your reports somewhere hosted, then you can also do that. Um, so what is Shiny? So Shiny is a package in R that creates um, interactive dashboards, dynamic dashboards, Victoria. And it's really, really cool. I've used it quite a bit um, in, not with the NHS specifically, but in my past work. Um, just, yeah. Um, and it's really, really powerful. So it's kind of like Power BI in the sense that um, you kind of create a dashboard, but what's really cool about it is that you have a lot of control over the, um, the interface and the development of the actual dashboard itself. So a lot of the functionality you can code, uh, yourself and you can kind of really, really be really picky about things and put things in specific places. Um, you can use, uh, something called CSS to, to manipulate the, the shiny dashboard to change things like fonts. Or, or, or color schemes and stuff like that. So you can do a lot of really, really cool stuff. Yeah, Chris did write a book on Shiny. And um, Chris, do you wanna just pop the link in there? Cause I know maybe people are interested in that. Um, yeah, absolutely, Victoria, no worries whatsoever. Uh, so yeah, how are we doing on the projects? Have we all created them? Ah, beautiful, okay. Should I get started then? Are we all good to go? Is there anybody else? lagging along. Nope. Okay. Awesome. Great. So <clears throat> creating an R markdown file is really, really simple. So there's a, a, a couple of ways to do it. Um, I, um, okay. I'm good. Okay. I do it like this. So there's this file button up here. 
and there's this little piece of paper with the green plus. So I just click on that. I come down to R Markdown, and I click on that, and it's going to open up. Oh, did I not install R Markdown? That's hilarious. So we'll all have to install R Markdown <laughs> in an R Markdown workshop, apparently, for whatever reason, which is really weird because I didn't do that yesterday. Here we go, guys, the technical issues. Okay, so, okay, great. I've like opened that 12 times now. Okay, so if everybody comes down and clicks R Markdown, it'll probably 99% most likely ask you to update your R Markdown package in which it'll just do what it just did to me. Um, and once that's done, um, it should open up this little hub. Is everybody here? Did anybody get lost with that whole issue? I apologize for that. That was my, my fault. So I'll just assume that everybody's okay. That's about how long it took for me. So it should be good for everybody else. So here we see new R Markdown. And this is exactly what it sounds like. Um, it's just a little hub where you can kind of specify some of the parameters of building a new R Markdown file. Um, so we see here like title, author, and we have this default option. I'm trying to get to the cloud, but can't seem to register, but just go ahead. Okay, sorry, Joanna. Um, maybe Chris, if you can help Joanna um, figure out what's going on, then she can catch up. So we have this default output format, uh, HTML, PDF, Word. So these are all different output formats that you can do in R Markdown, like Mohammed mentioned earlier. Um, the output that I was using was HTML, and I think that's probably the, the most used, like probably the most used output format is HTML. I would say the second is PowerPoint. So you can actually do kind of PowerPoint presentations. And there's kind of two flavors, or I guess three flavors of those PowerPoint presentations. You can do like an HTML presentation, which um, is with these two packages, IOSlides and Slidey. You can do a PDF presentation with Beamer, or you can do a PowerPoint, just regular PowerPoint presentation. Um, so yeah, and then um, here we have Shiny. So like Victoria was asking, this is Shiny. So using our markdown, we can create a Shiny document or a Shiny presentation where we can incorporate some of the Shiny um, framework, but we're not gonna talk about it today. And we also have some things like from template, which we're also really not gonna talk about, um, but just know that those options are there if you ever get to the point where you're, you're ready to use them. So with these documents, um, we're just gonna change the title. We're gonna call it My Analysis. Um, author is me or you, and we're just going to create an HTML file. So once we have all of that together, we have our title, we have our author, we have our HTML, uh, we're just going to click OK. And that should create an, uh, yeah, it should create a, a, like a little file for us, right? So there's a lot going on here. Um, but don't, don't, don't worry, don't distress. It's not at all confusing because we're going to talk about every single aspect and it should be very clear to you. The first thing that we're going to do, though, is we're just going to go up to this knit button here. It's this little piece of yarn with this needle in it. And so knitting is how we generate our R Markdown report. So there's all of this jumbleness inside of the report, right? But when we're actually ready to like run the report to make sure everything's working, nothing's broken, and to just uh, make sure that, yeah, everything's working as, as should be, and to actually see the actual output of our markdown file, we click this knit button. Um, so when we do this for the first time, it's always gonna ask us to save the report. So we're gonna do that. We're just gonna quickly um, save the report. Uh, we're just gonna save it. There's an exercise folder, but we're just gonna save it outside of everything um, just because it's easier. Um, Apologies, you're going to see that. We're just going to move it over here. Chris is helping out Joanna. Um, so we're just going to create it in our, in our base folder. So we're not going to open the exercise. We can create it here. So I'm just going to call it my analysis. So um, some good practice is whenever you're creating files, you should never leave any spaces. Um, I know I've done that um, like with the intro to R Markdown but that's because it's a PowerPoint. It's not really like an actual coding file. Um, 
So that's all right, Chris. No worries. So yeah. So what we're gonna do? We're gonna create my analysis, and we're just gonna click save. So once we click save, it's gonna generate this report. So whenever we create an R Markdown uh, file, it automatically populates the R Markdown file with just some arbitrary data. In this case, um, actually, I say arbitrary. It's always very specific. Um, so it's it's a data set called MT, or it's the data set called cars, and um, the cars data set is just like a base uh, base data set that comes with base R, and it just kind of is an example. It kind of like walks us through like really simple. So like this is an R markdown report. Markdown is a simple so on and so forth. You can click knit, which is what we just did to generate the report uh, that includes the content as well as the output of any embedded code, which we'll talk about in a bit. And we can include plots and stuff like that. We're going to talk about all of this, but for now, we're just going to exit out and we're just going to forget we saw that. So we've we've run the report, we've knitted it, or excuse me, we've created the report, we knitted it to generate it. So now it's saved, it's in our place, right? And you should have two things. If you just click this refresh button at the bottom right here, it should refresh this and just put it in alphabetical order. I'm like really OCD, so I like my files to be in alphabetical order. And you should see in myanalysis.rmd, and you should see a myanalysis.html. And so the RMD is the file that we're looking at right now. And that's the file that like we can uh, put our code in and we can change things and we can format and do all of that really cool stuff. The HTML is the output. And so when you click on the HTML, you'll see open an editor or view in web browser. So if we click on open an editor, it's gonna open up here in, in this pane. And so this really doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, and so I, I've actually never had to open it in the actual viewer pane. I'm pretty sure this is mostly used if you're trying to debug something or if there's like issues and you're like, I don't know why this is happening. Then you can look at the actual source code of how it generates the R Markdown report, which can be useful if you kind of understand all of this. I'm gonna be honest, I don't understand it. So I'm not gonna recommend we do, we ever really open this. Um, questions, questions, questions. Um, please see advice below. Try logging. Okay, everybody's trying to help Joanna. Thank you guys, it's awesome. Okay, so on the flip side, we have open and editor, but we also view in web browser, which is what we want, right? We wanna, we wanna view the report. So we can click on this button here and it'll open up our analysis in, in the web browser, which is really cool. So that's good. Um, and yeah, so we can just kind of take a look at it. We can make sure that everything's how it's supposed to be, et cetera, et cetera. So let's just exit out of this again, because we're not gonna look at that. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about, we've created our report. So, so how does it work? Well, good question. So our Markdown uses Markdown language to generate a report. So it also supports like a variety of other languages that we'll talk about when we get to a certain section. Uh, and that's for like data generation, manipulation, and of course, visualization. Um, so our markdown essentially works in kind of like three different components. The first one is the YAML, which stands for yet another markdown language. And that was the name of it, I think like three or four years ago. And I could be wrong, but it might've like actually, the name might've actually changed, but I continue to call it the YAML because that's what I was, that's what I've called it since like I started. So I'm going to keep calling it YAML and we'll talk about what that is. And so that's the section that like creates and formats the specific type of output, the report output, as well as like some additional kind of formatting within the report. <clears throat> Excuse me. The second bit is, is the markdown area. And so this is like where we're doing our commentary, our text formatting, uh, outlines, um, a lot of like, so we'll talk a lot about like the functionality of that. So like how to create those tabs, like I showed in the example, uh, uh, the, uh, like headers, lists, all of that really kind of like useful stuff when you're building reports. And finally, we have the code area, which I think is kind of like the coolest part of our markdown. Um, and so like this is th these, this code area is called chunks. And this is like where the code will go when the report is run. And so we'll talk about that when we get there. So YAML, yet another markdown language. So like I said, the YAML is used to format the report as well as like create the type of report. So the YAML is defined by these three little dashes on the top and on the bottom. 
and some output options, as we saw when we created our, our Markdown report, is HTML, PDF, Word, PowerPoint, Shiny, and much, much more. Um, so yeah, so let's scroll back to our, um, lost it, okay, there it is. Uh, so only one browser at a time to connect to our studio session, you may reconnect. Did somebody kick me out on accident? That's fine, no worries. So we're just gonna take a quick look at this. So I'm just gonna separate this a bit so we can kind of talk about it and, and delve into it. Um, so as you can see, this is our YAML here. We have our three dashes on the top, we have our three dashes on the bottom, and then we have some components that are kind of within our, uh, our report. So the first thing is the title. This is something that we populated ourselves, that parameter we, we entered the information, right? When we created the report, we called it title my analysis. We also entered the author, uh, which was ourselves, right? So this should be your name. Something that auto populates is the date. And this is the date that the report was created. In our case, it's November 3rd, 2021. And then finally, we have the output, which is the HTML document, right? So if we were to change this to Word, theoretically, uh, we would get a Word export. Ah, strictly speaking, the M and Yamble is markup. Amazing, Andrew. There you go, correcting me. I appreciate it. So yet another markup language. Um, great, that's amazing. Um, so yeah, correct me, and I'll fix that uh, in the slides. If somebody wants to, maybe Chris or Mohammed can make a note for me to correct. It's yet another markup language, not yet another markdown language. Um, and that'd be amazing. Okay, cool. We well, yet another markup language. There you go. My first mistake, as to be expected for the first time I'm giving this, uh, this, this workshop. So that's cool. Awesome. So great. So we have like this really cool YAML, right? And this um, kind of generates the the format of the report, it populates the title, it populates our like the author name, it gives an automatic date, and then we have kind of like this output, uh, which we specify is in um, uh, HTML. So something that we can do is we can do additional formatting in the YAML. So this is like the, like the, the basic, right? So just like the basic information. What we can do is we, we can actually start manipulating some of this to, to give us some additional functionality. So that's what we're gonna do. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, let me actually walk through this step by step because uh, the YAML can be very like nitpicky. So if you um, have like an extra space somewhere or if your lining is incorrect, then it can cause some issues. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the, the we're going to put our cursor right in front of the H and we're just going to click enter and then we're going to click tab. So just to do that again, that's enter and then tab. We're going to go to the end of this thing, and we're just gonna put a colon, oh, sorry, a colon at the end. So if you notice, it's kind of hard to tell by the coloring of the report, but the HTML document was black before. And if you see now it's turned blue. So essentially the YAML works like this. You have parameters and then you can create sub parameters. In this case, we had an output and the actual entry was the HTML document, but now we want to manipulate our HTML document. So we've created a new parameter called HTML document, and now we're going to populate that uh, parameter with some subparameters. Um, was that really confusing? Does anybody need me to re-explain that? I think it become clear as we continue uh, doing this. So maybe I'll just move on, and then if we kind of get to like a, a nice stopping point, uh, we can ask some questions. So now we have this blue HTML document, right? So something that's really cool and I always find useful, especially when I'm doing kind of like longer reports is creating a table of contents. So to do that in our markdown, we're just gonna do TOC and then do a little uh, colon. So just to repeat myself again, we're gonna come here, we have this colon, we're gonna come to the end of it, we're just gonna click enter and it should auto correct you to the specific lining that's required for YAML. Um, because again, it can be really nitpicky. So if I were to put it here, um, it, you see how it's, it's, it is blue, but if I were to run this, I'm 99% certain it wouldn't work. Um, so we need it to be kind of in line and in the correct place. So once we have this TOC here, we're just gonna come over, we're gonna put true. 
And you see how it's like light blue, right? So we can leave this as true. We can leave this as false, right? So sometimes there's like, like a base YAML that you want to create. So if I have like, like a formatting that I always use that I really like, then it might be worth like just copying this and pasting it like in a text file. And every time you create a new R Markdown report, you just delete the YAML that's there and you just paste in your kind of your base YAML, if you will. So if you like kind of play with some of this functionality, you can create one of those and then you can kind of import that and you don't really ever have to like touch it again, which I think can be really nice. Uh, which link? I think maybe we're using the wrong link. Uh, does everybody have? So Hansel, don't worry. If you carry on, because okay. we're trying to support one colleague, uh, okay. and uh, just you just carry on. We're, we're in the behind the scenes. We're supporting her. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. No worries. Great. So the table of yeah. So you can create kind of like a base YAML, and then just kind of import that every time you create an R markdown. Um, so as an example. Um, Let's just create a new text file. This isn't something you have to do, but like this is just an example of something that I do. Um, so I just copy this. Like, let's say I'm always going to use this as like, this is my starting point, for example. I'm just going to come over here. I'm just going to paste it and I'm just going to save it as like my YAML, for example, or whatever. And then by doing that, I always have like this. So if I ever create a new R Markdown report, um, I'm just just for kind of, I should kind of delete this and I'll just come over here to my text file that I just opened and I'll just take this and I'll just paste it, right? So that's just kind of like an example of, of how you would like create a base YAML. Um, but yeah, so let's continue talking about the functionality. So with that TOC, so we can have like a static TOC, in other words, like it doesn't move or we can have um, a dynamic um, TOC. And what I mean by dynamic is like it follows you along the screen, which is what's happening in that one example that I showed. And we do that using TOC underscore float um, with the, the little colon as well and true, right? So now uh, all of our, so let me explain this as well. I apologize. So with the table of contents, um, by default, I believe it goes to headers deep Looking at like a table of contents in a book um, you have um, kind of like an introduction section right and then in that introduction section you might have subheadings so by default our table of contents goes um, kind of two subheadings deep so it starts with the heading so that's one and then two is like the first subheading so we can manipulate that as well by changing toc underscore depth and we can choose a number. So in this case, um, I usually like prefer to go with three um, because I might have like a sub subheading. So I have like my introduction, then I have a subheading, and then like like a note. So like a, like another subheading that like says something. Um, and we'll talk more about how to create headers here in a second when we get to the actual markdown. So that's kind of like most of what I use um, in my YAML manipulation. But there's a lot more functionality. Um, that you can that you can have uh, with your R Markdown uh, YAMLs. And there is a link that I'm going to attach that I have here. Let me just copy and paste it into the chat. And there are different um, there are different like parameters. Um, that you can use in different outputs. So for example, this is all respective to say HTML. So if you try to do like a TOC float and like on a PDF report, that just won't work, right? Because PDFs are static, right? They don't, they aren't interactive. They don't, you can't manipulate them. Um, so this would only work in say HTML. Um, so there are a lot of like different tidbits um, and stuff like that, that uh, maybe if you're trying like an HTML output, it will work. But then if you go to like a PDF output, it won't work. So that, I, I just attached a PDF output, or excuse me, I just attached an HTML kind of cheat sheet. Um, and then this is a PDF cheat sheet. And I, I want you guys to take a look at definitely the HTML one here in a little bit, because I want you guys here in a little bit, again, apologies, uh, saying the same thing twice. 
to, to actually try building your own R Markdown report. Um, and so that will be useful in case you want to use like some additional functionality that I haven't talked about. Um, so yeah, so that's essentially the, the YAML. So if we run this report, um, right, we just click our knit button again, it'll generate this and it'll pop up this huge screen. So now we have like this little, um, yeah, this little section here, this little table of contents here that's floating. It's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, that's that's awesome. Well, great. Um, but look at this. I have this like summary cards, and that's generating the summary function, um, which kind of creates this table. And that's okay, right? Like if I want people to see what I've done in my code, um, that's nice to have this here, right? But at the same time, if I'm like sending it to a clinician or something, um, I might not want them to 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 see the code on the back end. And so there, there are two ways to kind of fix that. So one is what I'm going to show you now, which you can do in YAML, which is like, it doesn't remove it, but it hides it, uh, which is really, really nice when you're trying to be kind of cheeky. Like I know, for example, people have asked me to do like not, not difficult things, but relatively complex things that they think might be really simple. And so I might like cheekily put in this like code hiding option and then they'll kind of be scrolling down the report like, oh, what is this? And they'll click on it and they'll see this like giant bunch of code and like, oh my goodness, you're amazing. Um, so like really cheeky way of kind of showing off the work that you've done. Or if you're um, maybe submitting something a bit more professional where they want to see the code so that they can re reproduce your results, um, then that might be really, really important. Um, and you don't want all of your code there. You just want to kind of have it there, but be hidden. So that's what I'm going to show you now. Um, and so you do that by, again, going to the YAML. We're just going to go to the end of our, our TLC flow, true. Go to the very end. And we're just going to click enter. And we're just going to have, again, it's going to be the same line. Make sure that it is, or there could be issues. And we're just going to go code underscore folding. And we're just going to go true as well again. So now that we've done that, we're just going to come back over here to our little knit button, our, our ball and our ball of yarn and needle, and we're just going to click that again. Uh, what did I do? Uh, how do you add comments in R Markdown? I've added some with hash, but they're now in my contents. Ah, great question. So R Markdown is different to the actual R script in that you, to comment, it's actually different to uh, to what you think it is. So we'll talk about that when we get to the Markdown section. That's a really good question. Um, but I guess to answer your question right now, a hash is how you create headers in R Markdown. So what you've just done is actually create a header. You didn't actually comment your code. Um, well, unless you're in a code chunk. But again, we'll, we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, I might have an issue with my knit button for whatever reason. Give me one second while I figure out what's going on. Is my code folding? Uh, why isn't that working? Code folding. Um, so I'm looking at my cheat sheet, guys. That should be working. Interesting. Why isn't that match.arg code folding? Arg must be null or character vector. Oops. What do I do? Oh. Let's move this up right after. Oh. Yes, the parameter isn't true, it's hide. Oh. Um, yeah, so if we look at it now, um, previously we had that like little like grayed out box, right? That's its summary, um, summary cars here. But now it's gone. And instead we have this little like thing right here. It says code. And so if we click on that, oh look, now that's our code, right? So right now, it's, this is like a one-liner type thing, right? So it's not really much to hide, um, let's be honest. But uh, if we were to have like a really, really kind of involved report with a lot of code that needs to be, like the code needs to be shown be for reproducibility reasons or whatever, then it, it, you know we can include this and we can kind of hide all of our code. And then if somebody wants to, 
say, okay, well, this is really cool, but I want to see all of the code for everything while I'm reading through it. And they can come up to the top and they can say, show all code. And that'll show all of the code, like hidden code bits or hidden code chunks throughout the entire report. And then if they're like, okay, I'm done with that, then they can hide. Or they can just click on a specific like little section um, and they can you know, open that up and it'll be all fine and dandy. Is there any questions on that? Yeah, thank you, Andrew. It did need to be hide. Any questions on that before we move on? Cool. So that is basically most of the functionality that I'm going to go through with the YAML. We'll come back to the YAML here in a little bit when we're talking about something called inline coding, which is when we're actually talking about like coding chunks. So what we're going to do is we're just going to exit out of this for now. Uh, we'll come back to it later. And this is the space that you guys will be doing your, your kind of personal analysis, little project, your little uh, kind of project during the workshop, which I'm really excited for. Um, so we're just going to exit out of this and we're just going to open up our exercises and we're just going to come to data import and wrangle. Um, so this is something that I've kind of already built out and it has a bit of a skeleton framework of some of the stuff that we're going to talk about. Um, so everything should be working. And if I'm talking about something and you're thinking to yourself, this is definitely not working for me, please, please, please let us know so we can figure out what is going on and make sure everybody's on the same page. Yeah, great. So with that, uh, let's get into this. Yeah, so we have uh, data import and wrangle. So uh, first of all, we're just gonna kind of go through Markdown now. So let's kind of just quickly, everybody stay on that page, but we're just gonna kind of go to my slide uh, just because I made them and I kind of want to use them because uh, I invested the time. Uh, so yeah, the Markdown area is used to format within the reports itself. So some examples of this include like headers, tabs, uh, bolds, italics, uh, lists, um, and, and much, much more. Um, and this is kind of like, kind of hard to tell here, but you see here we have like these two hashes and it's like, like Victoria said, oh, why isn't my comments working? Well, because in the actual markdown language, uh, hashes actually create headers. They don't actually comment anything. And then we have kind of like just some writing, right? So this is an arc markdown document. Uh, markdown is a simple formatting syntax uh, for authorizing uh, you know, for authoring HTML, PDF, and MS Word documents, et cetera, et cetera. And then, oh, you see here, we can like do like links. That's cool. Um, and so we'll kind of talk about all of that uh, while we're going through this. So where did, oh, oh, where did I find that to open it? Okay. If we're all, if we just, we just closed our, my analysis, right? So we're here in this project and we have like all of this really stuff that isn't super relevant. But we're just going to go down to exercises here. We're going to click on exercises. And we're going to go up to data import and wrangle. Right. So if you click this little, sorry, um, some background information. This is like there's different panes, right? So this is like the, the console. This is the environment. This is like our actual coding area. And this is like our file directory. So if we click on this little like double periods or double, sorry, um, you don't call them periods in the UK. I'm American in case anybody figured that out. Uh, this double full stops, um, you can come down here and you click exercises, right? So exercises, and then we're gonna open up data import and wrangle. So if you just click on that, it should open up here in the, in the viewer pane or in the coding pane. Does that answer your question, Susan? Just like give me a thumbs up, that'd be great. Right. Awesome. Amazing. Cool. So markdown. So basically, um, anything, any, any space in your markdown file that is like not the YAML and not the code chunk is going to be markdown space. And we'll talk about how you can see code chunks. If you see, this is a code chunk here. It kind of has like this grayed out background. So anything that doesn't have like this grayed out background, and anything that isn't part of like this YAML, which is defined by those three dashes on the top, three dashes on the bottom, is your markdown space. So, so headers. Headers are really easy. Uh, headers, you just use the hash key. Um, if I, sorry, American again, I'm using the wrong button for the hash key. Um, so if you use 
the hash key, you can create headers. So again, how we created like the table of contents, right? So if we wanted to like use our base table of contents, we could add uh, like a table of, uh, or our, our base YAML, excuse me. We could quickly add a table of contents and make it float, right? Like we just did. So this is good practice, right? Um, and then from there, I'll just leave that here for a second in case anybody is still kind of like not super comfortable with doing something like that. Um, I'll wait maybe 20 seconds while I'm talking about this. So again, we, you know, let's say we copy pasted our like base YAML, right? Into like a text file. We, we would just want to like delete our, our YAML and just import our base YAML, right? So once we have that, um, well, we can start manipulating the headers. So the headers, right? You just, like I just said, like 3 million times. Uh, with the hash key is how you, how you make them. So we can go, I believe, and um, maybe somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, you can go five deep in terms of hash. Uh, and so the, the, the less number hashes you have, the larger your header is going to be. The more hashes you have, the smaller it's going to be. And we can show that right now. So what we'll do is we'll just do two, and then we'll just call this test one. We'll do three. And call this test two. We'll do four and call this test three. We'll do five and call this test four. Just because I'm curious, let's do six. All right. So now if we go to our knit button here and we just knit that, I'll just leave it here for a second in case anybody's still looking. Should it throw an error? Good. Awesome. Okay, cool. Yeah, so you can do six. That's awesome. I didn't actually know that. So you can go six deep. Maybe you can go seven deep. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> somebody tested for me. Let me know. Uh, but yeah, so this is one hash. This is two hashes. This is three, four, five, and six. So um, yeah, depending on maybe like the importance of what you're talking about, um, different kind of seven doesn't work. Thank you, Jamie. Okay, cool. So yeah, six is the max. Um, so if, you know, depending on obviously just like you're reading a book or you're reading through a report or whatever, you have like your sections and you have like your subsections and stuff like that. Um, that's something else that you can do with your YAML. You can, instead of creating like sections, you can create numbered sections, uh, which is something that is in that link that I just uh, uh, sent to you guys. Um, so you guys can take a look at that, maybe incorporate that into your little scope analysis later. But yeah, so uh, just like if you're reading a report, you have like your headers and you have your subheaders and stuff. And here we have like this thing. So if we click here, right, we see we clicked on headers and this is the only thing that's kind of showing up in our, in our, in our table of contents initially. And the reason for that is because the headers is the largest header that we have. It's one hash. And so all of the other things um, are falling under that one hash, because if you see here, um, these are all two hashes, right? Two, 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 so on and so forth. And we have two here. So if we were to click on test one, what do you think is going to happen? Oh, look, test two, right? So um, if you kind of, is everybody understanding kind of how that works? So you have like your, your, the largest header is going to be like your top level of your table of contents. Your subheadings are going to be kind of at the next level, right? So if, if I were to put, um, another thing here and just say uh, second header, for example, and I were to re-knit this again, you see here that I have headers and I have second header, right? Because one hash is the largest header that we have. Nested, yeah, it's a great word to put it. So we have like nested headers basically. Um, so again, if we click on this, we see test one because we have um, kind of these headers in between, but then we have another header that's on the same um, level as the original one. And so uh, this second header is now going to obtain all of the, pre all of the, the subsequent headers uh, because again, like um, I missed your name, sorry, Judy said, it's all nested. So I'm pretty sure, yeah, so the default, like we were kind of manipulating before for the, the, the table of contents depth is three. Um, so one, two, three. Um, 
99% certain that's right, or it could be one, two, because it's actual depth, um, and they doesn't count the first one. Uh, maybe somebody can test that and let me know. Uh, but yeah, so essentially we have kind of that functionality. And then if we want to go like one, two, three, four, five, right, then we can change that in the YAML uh, using that table of TOC underscore depth, and we can change it to like five or six, right? And then we can go one, two, three, four, five, and we can break down uh, a lot more. But it all depends on your report, right? Which is what's really nice about all of this is that it's, it's, you know, it's all dependent on what you're trying to do, what you're trying to build. Cool. So next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about tabs. So, so tabs are really simple in the sense that, um, again, with the same, you use headers to create them. And it works off of like the same nested principle. So all of these, all nested headers underneath something that's been defined as a dot tab set. And so this is how you define a tab. Uh, and again, this is like from that example that I showed at the beginning of the day. Um, you kind of have like that, like you can click through the tabs, like the police and ambulance differences, et cetera. So you click one, it shows one, you click one, it shows the other. Default talk depth is three, header counts as one. Awesome, Jamie, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, uh, so this is how you create a tab set so using these curly brackets and then dot tab set. And there's some additional functionality like almost with everything that I'm talking about, there's always gonna be some additional functionality. Um, so you can like create kind of like bubble tabs and kind of have like a smoother curve on the outside, which I preferably like to do a bit more. Um, or you can have kind of like a hard corner on your, um, on your tabs, uh, really is preference, but we'll see that here in a second. Um, so yeah, so we're just gonna create one layer deep uh, headers and we're just gonna call this tab one we're gonna come over here, we're gonna call this tab two, right? So in tab one, um, we're gonna say, my name is your name. Um, and then your favorite food, um, and I love pizza. And in the second tab, we're gonna say, my name is Hansel Palencia, and I love your favorite movie. Um, well, I don't actually have a favorite movie. Maybe we shouldn't do that. Let's do, um, I don't know, something, something, I don't know. What do you like to do for fun? And I love uh, playing piano. Sure, great. So once we've done that, we have tab one and tab two, right? Coding. Yes, Tina. Um, oh yeah, you love coding. Awesome, yeah, definitely. Uh, so yeah, so let's knit and see what happens. So if you see here, we have this tabs header, right? So that's our like uh, two hash, right? And then we have our nested tabs. So this is three hashes and three hashes. And so we have tab one says, my name is Hansel Plantia and I love pizza. And the second one is my name is Hansel Plantia and I love playing piano. So cool, that's really cool, right? So Let's say I have like, um, maybe I want to differentiate between like teams. Um, so I can create a tab for each team and populate some data about that team under each tab, for example. Or let's say I have um, maybe like days of the week that I want to separate for some reason. Um, basically a way of, uh, of, yeah, distinguishing between certain things. Uh, for example, something I've done like really recently is I had like a really long governance report and uh, I, I, I told them previously that like, if we keep adding to this, we're going to have to create a shorter version. And they're like, okay, okay. And then they keep asking for things to be added onto it. I'm sure people have like similar experience with something like that. But eventually it got to the point where they said, oh, this is too big. We're in our governance meeting and we get like lost in it or um, yeah, it's just like too much information, et cetera, et cetera. So we want to create a shorter version. So instead of creating like a whole new report, what I did was I just made a tab, right? So we have a long version and we have a short version. So if you wanna look at the short version, you just tab over at the very beginning of the report to the short version, and then the entire report is a short version. Or if you wanna look at the long version, you just leave it on the long tab and then you can see everything. Um, so yeah, so something like that, for example. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways that you can use this. It's basically up to your discretion and to what you're trying to do. Again, the beauty of our markdown is it's like extremely, extremely versatile and it can fit your needs. 
uh, specifically. So you see here, we don't have any like bubble, like um, kind of specification on this tab set type thing. So because of that, um, it has like a hard corner, but we can do like a, a bubble thing and, and um, yeah, make it like, like more oval shaped tabs, more oval shaped, if that's like more aesthetically pleasing to you. Um, but that is included in that little link that I sent earlier with all of the HTML kind of tidbits. Awesome. Does anybody have any questions up to this point? What's the end of the tab? Needs white space before tab. White space before tab, super picky about spaces. Ah, yes. So do you mean like this? Is that what you guys are talking about? Like if you do like this, it won't work. Is that what you're saying? Yes, Susan. I saw your hand up. Yeah, it was an accident. <laughs> okay, no worries whatsoever. Yeah, I discovered you don't put white space, it doesn't work. Yes, so that's a really good point, guys. Thank you for mentioning that. So if you don't put a space in between your, um, that, that works the same for like just regular headers as well. If you don't put white space in between your hashes and your actual headers, uh, let's take a look at what happens. And blank lines between the code as well. Yes. So our markdown um, to differentiate between lines, um, we, it, okay, let me explain out. So to differentiate between like two different lines in our markdown, you either have to have a space between the lines or you have to have two spaces after the, the line that you're currently on. Does that make sense? That everybody could just throw like a thumbs up in case anybody doesn't understand what I just meant. So if you see here, you have my cursor, right? So if I were to do that, or to do that, for example, this would think it's all on the same line still for whatever reason. I'm not really sure why it does that, um, to be honest. It's like kind of a weird functionality in my opinion. But we have to separate it with an extra space or we can add two spaces at the end. I've actually never done it this way. So if it doesn't work, I apologize. Um, but I read recently that that does work. So somebody let me know if it doesn't and that'd be cool. And then with the headers as well, right? Like we were just saying, if you don't separate your white space on your headers even, it's not even just the tabs, but just like your headers, let's see what happens, right? Where'd my header go? Oh, look, look where it is, right? So make sure you're always putting your white space in between your hashes and your headers or your tabs or whatever it might be. And make sure you're always leaving space in between, um, yeah, in between kind of like what you're, what you're doing. So I think just in general, it's really good practice to always separate things really well, just so you can have like a really nice flow in your report, right? We see here, we have like our header sections and we have test one, two, three, four, five, which is really simple to read. And we have our second header, our top set. It's all very organized, very sorted, right? So um, I would assume that that's the reason why you have to do like spaces in between stuff, just because it, it wants you to be two spaces at the end of line works. Awesome. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of like uh, things that it doesn't force you to do, but it kind of forces you to do, if it makes sense. Um, just so you have like cleaner to read uh, commentary and code, et cetera. Okay, moving on. Bolds and italics. So um, in our markdown, uh, you can um, obviously write commentary like we just did, like my name is Hans Valencia and I love playing piano. But what if I really want to like specify, I don't know, like accentuate that I love playing piano? Well, I can use bolds. And the reason, and well, not the reason why, uh, the way we do that is by using double asterisks on both ends of what we're trying to bold. So if you see this turn blue, so that has become bold now. Uh, and when we render the report, it'll, it'll become bold in the actual report. For now it's just blue. So let's come up here to our header and we're just gonna make this bold as well. Awesome. The same goes with uh, italics. So if we want to create um, some italics, um, it's just one 
asterisk on each side. And that's like a lighter blue, you see the difference. So again, we're just gonna come up here and we're just gonna make some italics. So let's knit that and see what happens. Uh, bold and italics. So you say, my name is Hans Plenty and I love playing piano, which is in bold. My name is Hans Plenty and I love playing piano, which is in italics. Um, so that's, I think, really, really straightforward. There's a lot of other kind of like functionality tidbits um, when you're kind of just uh, writing commentary that you can do, some of which we'll get to here at the bottom, which is like inline coding, which is really, really cool. Um, but we'll get that to that in a second. So something else that we can do is we can create lists. So to do that, again, we use our asterisk, right? So um, we do an asterisk. And again, we need that white space, right? So we're just going to click space. And then we're just going to say, uh, yeah, just a list, basically. Um, so somebody maybe, uh, I don't know, what's like a really easy recipe? Spaghetti. Um, uh, uh, boil the water. Right, and so then we're gonna click enter and we're gonna click another asterisk, right? Um, put in the pasta. I feel really bad because I didn't actually add salt to the water. And so if somebody were trying to follow my recipe, it'd be really bad pasta. Um, cook the minced meat and uh, mix the tomato sauce. Um, and um, mix it all together. So yeah, we can create lists in, um, in, in our markdown, which is really cool. We can also create like numbered lists. So maybe this would probably be better fit in like a numbered list, right? It's like very se sequential. We can do one, um, I'm first, two, I'm second, three, I'm third. Uh, and we can kind of enjoy that functionality. So if we knit this again, And see here we have our like bullet point list, right? And we also have kind of this numbered list. Something else that we can do is we can add like sub lists. So we can kind of create nested lists, um, which I'm not going to do um, just because it's, to be honest, I've never actually used nested lists. So I don't think they're super useful but I think it's in the HTML link that I've already sent that has like a bunch of HTML functionality as long as like some markdown functionality. But if it's not, let me know. And then I can quickly um, do an example of that. Uh, okay, so with that, does anybody have any questions? Or are we all still on the same page? A lot of the stuff that we're talking about is really, really simple and really straightforward, um, but it's all stuff that I want to make sure everybody's comfortable with before we start doing our, hello, I'm a list, no need to worry about numbering. Oh, cool. So you don't actually have to put like numbers on there. It still numbers them for you, like one, two, three. Is that right, Chris? That's yeah. Right. I actually didn't know that. That's awesome. It's just obviously useful if you're going to be, if you know you're going to be, you know, when you move them, you have to then mess around fiddling with all the numbers. So I just write one at the beginning of everything now in case I move it. <laughs> That's cool. I didn't actually know that. So yeah, so there you go. Uh, learn new stuff every day. Uh, cool. So yeah, moving on. I think nice. Yes, very nice. Uh, importing pictures. So importing pictures. Um, is really cool in our markdown. Something that um, if you saw like in the examples from earlier today, I had like that little informatics kind of logo. And that's like our team's informatics logo. If you see that is um, here in images, we also have like NHSR pick, we have like the R markdown. So there's a bunch of PNGs here um, that we can kind of play with. So to import pictures, we're gonna do an exclamation point. We're gonna do a bracket, square bracket. And then we're just going to do a, uh, not curly bracket, but what was that curly bracket? Curvy, maybe it's probably better. I don't know, uh, parentheses, we're gonna put parentheses. Um, 
And then from there, we're just going to um, go into our image folder. So to do that right now, so let me explain something else quickly, which is really important as well. So this is the point where I'm going to explain this. Probably is a good time to do it. So when you create RMD files, um, apologies, let me, let me backtrack. So in R, you have like projects, right? So you can create a project report repository and you have uh, something called a working directory. Does everybody know what that is? Essentially, your working directory is where you're currently located in your file share. Um, so for example, our current, working, current directory, if you use this function, get WD, says that we're in cloud slash project, which is exactly what it says here in our file explorer. Does that make sense to everyone? Um, this is a really important bit. So I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page. Cool. Uh, Victoria saying yes. Um, Awesome. So we know where we're at, right? But if we were to try to um, import pictures by doing IMG, right? Uh, it might be just IMG slash. Uh, so let's go into our image folder here. So we did our IMG, right? So when we do that IMG slash, that we're, we're entering the IMG folder or the image folder, <coughs> excuse me. And um, we're just gonna look at this NHSR pick. We're just gonna pull that. NHS underscore R underscore pick dot JPEG. So it says here, no image at path IMG slash NHSR underscore or NHS underscore R underscore pick dot JPEG. So why is that, right? That should work because our current, our, our working directory is our is our cloud project. So all we need to do from here is move into our image folder and then use the path for that image and, and pull it into our, our markdown. So why isn't that working? Well, our markdown does this really funny thing where instead of using your project directory, it uses the location it's currently at as, as the working directory. So we're not actually in the project directory when we're using our markdown, we're actually in exercises. So to get to the image folder, we have to go out of exercises and then we have to go into image and then um, access that, that JPEG or that PNG or that, that whatever that image basically. So to do that, we're just gonna do a dot and we're gonna do a slash, maybe. Let me just look at my solutions just to make sure I'm doing it right. Sorry, a dot dot to to um two full stops, double full stop. So what that dot dot does is it pulls you back um, out of a folder. So we have what I'm gonna call our like parent directory, right? So that's like our, our working directory for this whole kind of project, which has all of these folders, it has the PowerPoint. It has your specific analysis, right? And it also, uh, and so, but our, our our markdown just because of how it works, it uses the current like location as its working directory. And so, when I'm trying to like, when I try to knit something, for example, it doesn't use like the actual project directory. It uses its current location. If it's inside of a folder, then you have to come out of the folder to access other folders. If that makes sense. Uh, so, so in this case, we're in exercises, right? Because that's where we're located. So we use the double full stop to go out of exercises into project. And then from there, we entered image. And then from there, we listed the path for that JPEG. And so if that all worked, you should get this NHSR community. This really sleek, amazing, beautiful logo that we all love so dearly. Is anybody confused about that? Not working for Tina. Uh, okay. Do you want to just post paste this in the chat? That you have. Is anybody else not working for anyone? Not working for me. No, it's fine. I think I got a typo. Duh. Okay, Victoria. 
So for the record, everybody should be, uh, I would hope everybody is in this data import wrangle, which is in the exercise folder. Is everybody there? Everybody good? Make sure there's no typos because we are listing like an actual file path. Uh, um, you'd have it a capital R, Victoria. It's, an, it's a lowercase r. Ah, no worries. No, no, no. So yeah, again, we're listing file paths here, right? Because we're actually like trying to find a file. So if we don't list the correct path, it's not going to work. So like Victoria there, she had a capital R instead of a lowercase r here, uh, which caused it to not work. Uh, Tina had uh, JPEG instead of JPG or sorry, JPG. So that didn't work. So again, it's very, very picky, very specific. Um, you can use the tab key to search for variable folders and files. Oh, that's really cool. Um, I didn't know that. Um, so thank you, Ina. Um, after slash, yeah. So that's kind of like um, almost if you were doing like a Linux type thing, um, or if you're just kind of like in the file directory, you can do a tab to, to search for one. Let's try that. I've actually never done that. And I come, I'm really curious now. So let's, oh yeah, that's, that's really cool. Okay, cool. Yeah. Everybody see how that works. That's really, really cool tidbit from, from Ina. Thank you so much. So let's say we're, we're, we're back in our exercises, right? So we're in our exercises. We need to go out. So we're going to do the double dot, the double full stop. We did our slash image to get into our image folder. We need to go slash again. But now I don't want to really like type it out. I want to like just pick one. So I, if I just add another slash, right? to say that I'm looking for something inside of this folder. And then I click on the tab button, it'll show up like this really nice little um, like pick list that I can just kind of pick my JPEG. That's really cool. Um, knitting error, unexpected symbol, HTML, TOC. Um, you don't have a uh, colon after your HTML. So if you come up here, you see HTML document, you need a colon and then it needs to be on a separate line, colon true. Cheers, absolutely. Cool, so moving on. Um, so that's how we import pictures, which is like kind of a really nice, cool functionality. Um, so for example, like I said, in the example from this morning, I always like to put like a really nice informatics logo at the top of my reports, because I think it looks nice. Um, if there's like, um, maybe something, maybe somebody sends you like an Excel sheet that has like some graphics, um, that you don't want to recreate. And this is something that's happened to me in the past. Like they've already put a lot of effort into making some graphics and then you try to like redo what they did, but they don't like how you did it. So like, no, just use mine, but you still want to use our markdown. You can use like the, what is this called? The, um, the snippet tool. And you can kind of just create like, like a little snippet or a little like thing of their, of their graph that they made like an Excel or whatever. And you can use, um, like a, like a JPEG import. And you can just kind of import like a, like just a picture of their graph. And then they're happy because they kind of use what they did, um, but you still get to use our markdown and it's like a lot nicer looking and you can fit it into where exactly you need it. It's not like on an Excel sheet kind of just all over the page or whatever. Uh, did import wrangle image not found in resource path, getting this error. Um, Chris, can you help Victoria out with that one because I think that's a bit more of a involved. Yep, I'll have a look. Can you align the image to the right of the HTML document? Okay, great. Oh, um, it needs to be in parentheses, maybe. That might be it. If it's not in parentheses, it might not work. So let's try knitting this. Hopefully it will. I think I might know what's wrong. I set the root directory up here. So that might be it. So if everybody, um, well, let me just test it first to see if this is the actual problem. I think everybody might have that issue. Yeah, that might be the issue. So everybody just comes up here to this thing that we haven't talked about yet and just puts a hash in front of that that should fix uh, Victoria's problem.
Okay, sorry, apologies about that. It's because I I messed with some of the working directory stuff while I was building this um, and I didn't fix it or I didn't remove it once I had already done it. So apologies, that was my fault, Victoria. Great, so we've done that image, great, awesome. Really, it looks really good, cool. So now let's come to, to hyperlinks. So hyperlinks are um, pretty straightforward. Um, it's kind of like exactly what you think. And I'm just gonna go to my solutions because I always forget the syntax. Um, I'm just going to kind of copy it and paste this. So basically, you can have um, um, hyperlinks inside of your report. So let's say, for example, you have like a hyperlink to like uh, a SharePoint site, or you might have a hyperlink to um, a report that supports or documentation that supports your report, like see documentation here, or you have um, like some sort of website thing and you want to to link to that in your in your in your report or something to that effects so this is really useful so this essentially works in like i am planning a break before lunch uh well let me rephrase once we finish with this um what's with, with like this markdown section we'll take a quick 15 minute break um, and then after that 15 minute break, uh, we'll come back and finish up the code chunk section. And then we'll do um, like a 15 to 30 minute, everybody kind of work on like their uh, like personal little, like our markdown project using some of the stuff that we've talked about already. Um, and then we'll see where we get to from there. And then, you know, obviously we'll have breaks. Um, does anybody need a break? Let me ask that. That's probably a better question. Soon, okay. So let's finish up with this then. Should be pretty quick, I think. I could go for five minute break, timing works for me. Um, so let's finish off um, with this section and the LaTeX section because the plots and the inline code kind of go in conjunction with um, everything else we're talking about. So here in maybe five minutes, we'll take a break. And then a quick, maybe a quick five to 10 minute break and then we'll come back. So uh, quickly, hyperlinks, really, really simple. You just use the URL of whatever you're wanting to hyperlink to. And then you can also add kind of like a little section that is like the actual hyperlink itself. Um, so for example, here I have like my LinkedIn um, and then I have like my LinkedIn profile here. Um, so you can literally pull any URL from the internet and just kind of paste it here and it should be able to uh, find that and open up uh, open up that, that, that thing with no issues. So bring them up my LinkedIn. Um, I mean, you know, open up my LinkedIn. This is my LinkedIn. Uh, hell, it's me. Um, yeah, so pretty cool. Um, there's some additional stuff that you can do with this. Um, uh, for example, instead of like actually showing the link, you can have it like just be the words, um, which I'm not going to do because everybody, we're going to take a break here in a second. Um, maybe we can talk about it when we get back, if we choose to. Last thing we're going to talk about is kind of like maybe slightly more advanced functionality um, in 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 our markdown. And that's something called LaTeX. So has anybody ever used LaTeX before? I have. Yes. Yes, no. Uh, yeah, so LaTeX is another, like a completely different language, basically. And... Uh, it's, it's mostly used for doing like mathematical equations. Um, so let's say you have like maybe more of a technical type role where you are developing, um, building some sort of function that defines some sort of like statistical distribution. So you can actually use LaTeX to, to, to write that in your report. So for example, let's say, um, so to define a LaTeX space, and this is kind of getting into um, our next section, we use this double um, uh, dollar sign on the top and on the bottom. And we're just gonna create some space in between. Again, space is super important. So I like to have like three lines in between the top and the bottom, so like one, two, three, and the bottom. So like five total, I just go to the middle one. And so, um, so we can just write LaTeX just really simply. Um, I'm not gonna get it. This isn't like a course in LaTeX. So I'm not gonna explain a lot of the syntax. Um, 
but we can, yeah, alpha plus beta equals gamma, which is not true like 99% of the time, but for example. And then if we knit that, um, we'll get this really cool little like mathematical equation in our report. Or I should do it anyways, unless I need to install something. Well, it should look like this. There might be something going wrong here because we don't have some sort of LaTeX package, uh, which would be my fault. So I apologize on that. But for the majority of people, um, I'm pretty sure if you were working on this on your own, this would create like a really nice little mathematical equation inside of your, um, inside of your, your, yeah, your whatever. Uh, maybe I can just quickly, so this is my personal R mark down, or R studio. Uh, maybe I'll just quickly do like a quick test just to show you. So I don't like leaving it like that, sorry. Um, Um, and stay here. Okay. Uh, ad hoc. That's three. <laughs> you can't tell I do a lot of tests. I know my R Studio looks different. That's because I've customized it to my preferences. Um, so just don't worry about that too much. Um, that is so weird. Why is it doing that? Okay. How about this? During the break, I'll figure out why the heck it's doing that. Uh, because I have actually no idea. Cool. So anyways, just really quickly, that was LaTeX. So you can do um, these little, yeah, these little kind of chunks. If you see here, luckily our markdown automatically outputs any outputs that you have, any like code outputs or LaTeX outputs in your R markdown, it kind of shows it dynamically whenever you're creating it. So this is what it's supposed to look like. So you can at least see that. But yeah, so you can do that in your reports, which is really, really nice if you have like more of a technical role, building mathematical equations or, or whatever it might be. Um, yeah, so with that, uh, let's take a five to 10 minute break. I'll be around still if anybody has any questions, needs to catch up, um, feel free to unmute yourself and let me know or ask questions in the chat. And yeah, we'll be back in, in, in a few minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, Tina, I believe it is possible to center or right align images. Um, yeah, what, what browser are you using, Johanna? Oh, yeah, you definitely switch browsers to Chrome, maybe. So, so Tina, yes, you can um, shift your images to the right. The thing that's a bit more advanced because we have to incorporate HTML. So um, maybe I'll, I'll wait to answer. Let me just put pop this in the chat. Um, and we can kind of talk about it very briefly.
Oh, excuse me. That's not the whole thing. Why isn't it pasting the whole thing? Let me do this back. Just to let you know, I am here. You're not talking to yourself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> cool. Something like that, right, Tina? Yeah, that's right. That's exactly because that's where we tend to place our images. Yeah, awesome. So that's the code for it if you want to take a look. Yeah. I'll grab a, um, I'll snip that. Yes, go for it. Um, so uh, I guess I'll quickly explain it, but I'll probably explain it again. It looks as though the empty lines around are not required. Okay, awesome, Wayne. Good to know. Did you fix it for me then? Maybe that's why I was having issues, is because I had the, the empty spaces. Ah, yes, beautiful, Wayne. Thank you. Much appreciated. That makes perfect sense. Okay, cool. So, yeah, we'll talk about that when we get back then. And we'll credit you, Wayne, for fixing it. Much appreciated. Um, so Tina, this is, isn't actually Markdown, this is HTML. So Markdown incorporates a lot of different languages or it can, it doesn't incorporate, well, it does incorporate, but it can incorporate a lot of different languages. And so we use HTML to manipulate um, the actual output because we're outputting an HTML a document, right? Um, so we can use HTML within our markdown to manipulate certain things. In this case, we're manipulating the image style class, which is something that is kind of has to do with HTML. So we're manipulating the image style class to say it's going to float to the right instead of floating to the left. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Is that, is that with the um, the pointy brackets at the end? Is that indicating that that's HTML? Yes, that is indicating. Um, so for example, if we wanted to do like a header, uh, we could do it like um, header and then do like a, like a slash header whenever to finish that, you know. So just typical HTML really. Um, but again, that's not something we're going to go into any depth whatsoever, just because um, it's definitely more advanced um, incorporating like multi-language markdown clauses. Um, like, yeah, there's a lot of stuff you can do with, with that. I mean, you can, like I said, you can incorporate CSS and kind of manipulate the actual, like, uh, you can get like snow to fall on your reports during like Christmas time. <laughs> so there's like a lot of, yeah, like a lot of really cool things that you can do. Um, but yeah, we're not going to do it just because it's really advanced and we don't have the time um, and still a lot of information to go through. And there's also the concept of just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah, absolutely. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. That's a very good point. Very, very good point. That's been my COVID mantra <laughs> with all of the lockdowns and lockdown releases. Just because you can go to the pub doesn't mean yeah. you should. <laughs> I know, I know. If only people would listen. Okay, we'll be back at 11.15. I'm just going to quickly...
Okay, got so eleven fifteen. Perfect timing. Um, okay, <clears throat> is everyone back from their short break? Probably should have said before we left that we'll be back at eleven fifteen. Shouldn't I have? That probably would have been a really good idea. Um, so let me keep in mind for next time. Uh, cool. I'll probably just wait another minute or two just to make sure we get every mostly everybody at least just wait till eleven sixteen. Um, but in case you were uh, in the loo or grabbing a drink, so uh, Tina asked a really cool question. She said, uh, well, uh, what if I want to like put my image on the right side? Because that's what we kind of do for all of our reporting. And I said, well, you can incorporate something called HTML, which is like a completely separate language from what we're talking about here um, inside of your R Mark 10 report. And so this is something that I've mentioned before is that like there's a lot of functionality. There's a lot of things that you can do that we're not just not going to talk about um, just because it's uh, it can get quite advanced um, because you are incorporating maybe two, three, even four languages in a single uh, R Markdown report. Um, but this is the code to do that in case anybody wants to steal it. Um, so this is HTML, which is defined by these like little um, carrots. Um, and so we're just we're just manipulating the image style class. Um, and so what that means is like there's like a there's like some rules that exist for image style and we're just like changing them so we're changing the float to um nearly always have to use html when i when i'm using images cool well, chris is saying it's really 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 basic so that's awesome so then maybe we should, maybe this is something we should include in the workshop in the future just like kind of html manipulation okay good point um, but yeah, so we're just kind of like manipulating that class and we're saying, well, uh, I don't want it to float on the left, which is what the default is. I want it to float on the right. And then we specify the image that we're talking about. So it's like literally the same thing as down here. Um, so hopefully that's helpful to everyone. Uh, I believe it's Wayne also fixed the problem with LaTeX. Um, so there shouldn't be any spaces in between um, the, the dollar signs. Um, so thank you, Wayne, for fixing that. Really, really helpful. Um, yeah. So everyone, everyone should be back now, hopefully. Um, so let's continue on. Uh, yeah, so now we're gonna get into kind of the third part of Markdown. So we're gonna talk about the code area. Um, so, the coding area, and sorry about the picture, it's a bit blurry, I apologize. But the coding area is used as a space to develop code for an R Markdown report. And the majority of times, this is where like the final output is gonna be. So like, it's gonna be your, your graphs or your tables, or maybe like a summary of like some statistical component or uh, whatever it might, whatever your outputs are, this is where they're gonna go. Um, so coming back to our, uh, our Studio Cloud, we're just gonna our plots. So to create a code chunk, there are kind of two main ways to do this. So you can either do it like manually, so you can do it yourself, or you can use um, the like RStudio IDE. Um, you can, you know, like how we created like the, the, the R Markdown, we can also create a code chunk, which is like this little thing, little C here stands for chunk. And you see this little green plus here is like a new one. So we just click on that. Oh, well, make sure that your cursor is inside of where you want to put it because it's going to insert the chunk wherever your cursor is. So like if I insert, if I have my cursor here and I try to insert a chunk, um, it's going to put it at like the next available space, if that makes sense. So for, for good practice, just put your, your cursor wherever you want your, uh, your chunk to go. So I'm putting it in between my plots and my inline code sections, which we'll talk about here in a second. Uh, and so you see here, I've clicked this green plus and there's like multiple little things. Obviously the default one is R, right? Has to be expected because we're coding in R. But you also have some bash, you have D3, which is a really cool language that does some like really cool visualizations that we're not gonna talk about. We have Python, we have R, C++, we have SQL, which is what I'm sure a lot of you use on a regular basis and we have Stan. In this case, we're just gonna insert an R chunk, right? Really simple, really easy. Cool. So, so plotting. So plotting in 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 our markdown is literally the exact same as plotting in 
um, in your R script. Um, so I'm not gonna go too into detail on like how to build plots because I think the intro to our course does that justice really, really well. Um, but we're just gonna kind of see how to pull in data from wherever and uh, just build like a really, really simple graphic. So here we have in our like main project repository or my, my, my main project directory, we have this little data section. So if we look, we have uh, data prep, which is kind of like some stuff that I did on my end to prepare the data for this. So we're gonna use this TOA underscore data.xlsx. So to do that, we're just gonna come up here to the very top, okay? And we're just gonna come and we're gonna run the current chunk. So this is like the setup for the whole project. So if you see here, we currently only have two chunks. Uh, this doesn't count as a chunk, by the way. This is a LaTeX space, like a little, oh, if you want to call it a LaTeX chunk, you can probably call it, a, that's probably, that's probably accurate enough. Uh, but we have like two R chunks. So it's, we know it's R because we have these three little ticks here. We have a curly bracket and then we have R and so that defines it as an R chunk. Uh, if we were to create another chunk, say for Python, it would have Python here. That's how it defines that it's a Python chunk. So in our case, we have two R chunks. We have one here at the top, and we have one here at the bottom. So if you see here at the top, this one was uh, kind of already there for you, and it has R setup. So whenever you create a new R markdown file, this chunk, R setup, is always going to be there. Um, and I've added some additional things to it. So the chunks can be manipulated so that outputs, so it outputs certain things. In this case, I said include equals false, echo equals false, and message equals false. So what are these things? Well, include is kind of intuitive. It includes it or not in the, in the report. So by setting include to false, it'll, it'll run what's in the chunk but it won't actually appear in the report. And so the reason I do this is because, well, first of all, we don't really want like our libraries loading and having that show up in the report because it's not really relevant to, well, 99% of the time, it's not relevant to anybody really other than ourselves. Echo is whether it shows up in the actual message. So you know how before we did like that whole code uh, folding in uh, the YAML? If we do echo equals false, then nothing will show up there at all. So we don't, there's no need to, to fold it or to hide it because it won't show up to begin with. So that little section that had that summary cars won't show up at all to begin with. And then message equals false. So oftentimes when we load in libraries or we like run something, we'll, we won't like get errors, but we'll get like little warnings, like warning, this package is depreciated or like it's old basically. Um, or something like that. And so by setting message equals false, those things won't show up in the actual report because if we don't set that, then those warnings will show up in our in our report. And that's something that we don't want, right? Because the last thing we want is to have like a really beautiful report and then to forget to include something like that. And there's like a bunch of like warning messages throughout the report. And then the person that's looking at it is like, oh, this is like, this is really good, but why is there like all these warnings in there? Is there something wrong? Like blah, 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 you know? So make sure we kind of always think about uh, these uh, param these chunk parameters or chunk options whenever we're, uh, we're, we're, yeah, working through this. And there are some other functions that you can use to set like a global chunk option. Um, and there's also manipulation of the YAML that we can do to set some like global chunk options, which we'll talk about when we actually build our plot. Um, so yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to just run this chunk. So there's like little, this little green arrow here. And we're just going to run current chunk. Um, so everybody should, it should be pretty fast for everyone because I did already install Pac-Man and these three libraries that we're going to use. Um, a quick note on like Pac-Man and like library um, organization. So it's, it's it becomes very often, especially as a team is growing in their use of using R, that we start sending maybe like scripts around to people. 
Um, and it could be possible that people are, are running on different versions of R. They're running on like different uh, library versions. So like somebody can be running on like a, um, like a newer version of the tidyverse, somebody can be running a later version of the tidyverse, et cetera. So what Pac-Man does is it makes sure that the, first of all, the libraries are installed and then it auto loads them. So if you pass on your, um, say like an RMD or even an R script to someone else, um, it'll, if they don't have like say read Excel installed on their machine, when it does this P load, it'll load and it'll make sure that everything is installed. And if it's not, it will install it for them and then it will load uh, those libraries. So it's like doing install.packages and library at the same time um, with like a check to make sure that, uh, that it is installed in the first place. And if it is installed, then it doesn't run install, obviously. Um, and there's also like some other really cool functions inside of Pac-Man, like uh, package, like update packages and stuff like that. So you can update all of your packages, make sure everybody's always with the newest versions and everybody's always on the same page. And so that makes like sharing of documents or of, of scripts or whatever, much, much um, simpler and make sure that everybody's always on the same page. So quick tidbit about that. That's not what this course is about, but I think it's really useful, especially if we're gonna be sharing our, our, our Markdown documents and stuff like that. Does that make sense to everyone? Does anybody have any questions about that? Awesome. So with that, um, yeah, so we run this chunk. So we've loaded our libraries. We're using Tidyverse, Lubridate, Read Excel. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna go down and we're just gonna read in our data. So again, I'm not gonna go into too much depth into how to do this um, just because the intro to R mark, the intro to R course kind of goes over that, but I'm just gonna make it kind of really simple. So we're gonna say data and we're gonna do an arrow. So again, using an arrow like this creates an object. Um, you can also use an equal sign. I prefer just to always use arrows because that's how I learned from like my coding days, my novice coding days at the beginning. Uh, and we're just gonna check our data folder. So this is called toa underscore data dot xlsx. Remember that the, um, the file path, right? Our current working directory isn't actually like the, the base project folder. It, we're in exercises because we're working in our markdown. So what we need to do is we need to go out of the exercise folder into the data folder and then select the file that we're wanting to look at. So we're gonna use the function read underscore Excel or maybe read underscore XLSX. Yeah, we're gonna use read underscore XLSX. Uh, we're gonna do uh, quick quotes and we're gonna do dot slash data or excuse me, dot dot slash data. So dot dot to come out of the exercise folder uh, slash data to go into the data folder. And then let's see, oh, it does work. So that little tip from Ina, uh, we can do another slash and then tab and we can kind of look through all of the files. So um, this times of access January through April, 2021.xlsx is kind of like the dirty version of this data set. And uh, if anybody's feeling brave, it's not that complicated to be honest, but if anybody's feeling brave whenever we get to like the personal projects, if you want to use this version instead of the clean version for like a little, I don't know, challenge, then feel free to do that. I also have like a data prep here, which shows how I cleaned it. Uh, and if you want to clean it a different way, then I would encourage you to do so. And uh, if you're trying to figure it out and you need a little clue, you can go to data prep here and you can figure it out. But anyways, we'll get to that when we get to that. Uh, but yeah, so for now, we're just gonna use, everybody's gonna use a clean version. We're just gonna use TOA underscore data dot XLSX. And we're just gonna read that in. So we see here, now we've populated data into our environment. We see it has 2,880 observations of four variables. So we can click on our data here and it pops up in our kind of thing. So here we have an hour start. We have a date, like an actual day date. We have a count and we have the month that it was in. So to give some background, what this is, is it's um, uh, time of access data for people who are calling uh, like a, a triage, like a, a crisis center. So we have the hour start, so zero equals uh, midnight. So the hour start would be zero to one, the date that it happened, how many calls there were during that hour period, and then the actual month uh, that, the, that happened, basically. So um, yeah, we're just going to like really easily, simply create like a really nice little graphic. 
So I'm going to use tidyverse um, syntax because uh, that's what I'm comfortable with. And I would encourage everyone to kind of follow along. Uh, in case somebody needs a refresher, this right here is called a pipe. On Windows, the shortcut for that is Control Shift M. Okay. And on um, Mac, the command is the, the shortcut for that is Command Shift M. So exactly the same, just Control and Command are uh, switched, obviously. Um, so what we're going to do is we look at the data set. Okay. We see we can have um, what kind of graph do we want to do? I don't know. Um, let's do maybe just like a, like a really quick, like just um, line graph. That sounds good. Um, uh, for each hour of the day. So we're just going to do a group by. Um, we're going to do hour underscore start. We're going to do our month, right? I want to pull that month in and use that as like a color variable, for example. Again, I, I'm, I know I'm going relatively quickly, um, but it's because this isn't like, this isn't a visualization course. It is slightly, very, very slightly, but not that the focus is like, how do we do this in our markdown, right? Uh, and then we're just going to do a summarize. Uh, we're going to say count equals um, the sum of counts. And we're going to M-A-R-M equals true because there are some NAs in there. Um, I already know that because I know the data set really well. Um, but yeah, that would be like looking through the data set, trying to figure out what missing values you have type thing. Um, so all of that should happen before you kind of start doing plotting. So there's a lot of like pre-work that I've already done. Um, so if you want to just follow along, that's completely okay as well. If you want to take a closer look at the data, uh, kind of do some more stuff, absolutely feel free to as well. Then we're just going to create our ggplot. Uh, AES X equals our uh, hour start. And since we grouped the hour start, it turned into a factor. And we want to turn that back into a numeric. Um, because if it's still a factor, it's not going to actually start from zero and go to 24 or 23, excuse me. It's going to do like some weird ordering because it's a factor, not a, not a numeric. So we need to change it back to numeric. Um, and so then we say Y equals the... Uh, um, the count color equals the month and the group equals the month because it's going to say that there's only one observation per per uh, per thing, which isn't true, but we just need to add the grouping variable in. So doing that, we should get this nice little graphic here. Uh, so cool. That's really good. Um, we see that when we run a chunk, the output, it always comes underneath the actual chunk. So that's functionality that you can actually turn off in the tools section. So if you go up to tools and you go to global options, um, you can actually turn that functionality off. Uh, we're going to leave it on um, just for the purposes of this workshop. But if you don't like, uh, is it in code? Um, might be in parent type or I can't remember where it is. The point is, you can change, you can turn that off in in our markdown. Uh, paste the code in the chat, maybe. Yes, definitely. Um, oh, so that's the graph code, and this is the actual read in the data code. I'm sorry, I've been backwards. Apologies. Um, so yeah, so we created like this really nice, simple graphic. Um, there's a lot more stuff we could do. Like we could change the theme and we could like, uh, like you see here, the legend is backwards. Like January should be the first one. So we could like factor re-level this so that January is first and it goes sequentially. Uh, we could add like a year. So to January, 2021, if we had more data, eventually we can like, you know, um, uh, track that over years and stuff. Um, so there's a lot of different stuff we could do, which I'm not really going to talk about too much because I want you guys to kind of explore this whenever you're working on kind of your, your, your little project here in maybe 20 minutes or so. Um, but yeah, so, so that's kind of like some really simple. So we can kind of press this little arrow button to expand or collapse the output. Um, so if you don't want to see it, you can kind of just click up here. If you want to remove it, you can press this X, which clears the output. Or if you want to see it in a new window, you can click here and that will pull it up in a new window, um, which can be nice if you like wanting to look at um, 
I don't know, whatever. So if you see here, this R console section says like summarizes group output by our start, you can override this. So this is what I was talking about when I was talking about like that message functionality in the chunk where it says message equals false. This is a, a quote unquote warning. Um, so if I were to leave uh, the chunk as is, and by as is, I mean that, look, there's nothing like, there's no additional parameters in here. Um, this warning would show up, uh, I believe it'd be ov over the actual plot. It'd be on top of the plot. And that's kind of like a weird thing to have. So we're going to here in a second do message equals false to get rid of that. And then we can kind of look at it again. So yeah, like I said, a lot of more stuff we can do. So we're just going to add that message equals false. So you can do F or you can actually write out false. It's up to you. So if we look at this again, it will probably still be there. Uh, yeah, we need to actually knit it. So cool. Um, once we've done that, we're just going to come up here again, and we're just going to click knit and see what happens. All right, object evil, uh, object false, not found. It needs to be lowercase. But no, it's, it's all capitals. You want? Oh, that's right. It is all capitals. Thank you. Chris. So yeah, it needs to be all capitals. Um, apologies on that. Cool. So now we can go down and we can go down to our plot section and we can see this beautiful plot. Uh, here we have eco set eco eco default at or eco echo default is true. So that's why we can see the code. If we want, we can change our chunk parameter to echo equals false and we can remove um, that that little thing or whatever. The, or we can remove this, excuse me. Um, if you see, there's no warning here because we set message equals false. Um, and yeah, so this kind of looks, it looks good, but I kind of want the plot to fill up like the whole screen, right? Like there's all this here, this, this, this is how far it can go kind of thing. I want it to kind of fill up the whole thing. So what else, another thing we can do is we can mess with like the figure width. So we can say fig width and we can increase that to say 10. So I think the default is like, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's like the width is set to six or eight, and the height is set to four, I believe. I could be completely wrong, but we're going to increase the width to 10, and we're just going to run that again. We're just going to knit it again, and if you see here, our plot magically extends further out, and it looks a bit cleaner now. We, you know, it's like more spread out it kind of shows up fills up more of the white space which i think looks nice as well um kind of fits out like the end if we had um what's it called if we had a logo here like a top right and we wanted like all of our plots to be aligned type thing uh, so yeah really really good uh does anybody have any questions about that you have a typer link typo typo where's my typo my Twitter. Oh, do I have? Is that better? Yeah. Ah, perfect. Yes, that's how you do the hyperlink the correct way. I missed how you increase the size of the graph. Okay, size of the graph. It's this parameter inside of your R chunk. So you have these three ticks, then you have curly bracket brackets. Um, and then it's inside here. So in between all of these parameters, make sure you don't forget your commas. Um, when you turn something false or true, make sure it's all capital. And there are tons, literally tons of options that you can include in these chunks. There's so many options you can change. Uh, like here, if we just kind of, just for figures, right? We have like a line, um, alt, ASP, which I don't even, I, I don't even know what some of this stuff is. Cap is caption, D is like dimensions uh height fig.keep i don't know what that is fig.path if you want to specify a specific file path for the image uh some of this yeah like i said some of this stuff i don't even know what it does there's so 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 many options um to choose from when you're manipulating these code chunks and all of that is done in this just this little section of code here that will manipulate a lot of the kind of functionality of um of, of yeah of your report which is really really cool um, so you can really, really uh, uh, set it to exactly your needs and exactly what you want. Awesome. So with that, 
Um, there are some caveats to doing code like this. So the issue with doing development in R Markdown, what I mean by development is doing like data cleaning or data wrangling is that uh, R Markdown works sequentially or logically like follows the, the layout of the actual report. What I mean by that is that the chunk at the top will be run first and everything else will be run as follows. So it'll run this chunk first, and then it'll run this chunk. And then if there's another chunk, it'll run that one, and then that one, and so on and so forth, which makes a lot of sense, right? But code development doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes we build something and we're like, well, I don't really like it being in this like space. So I'm gonna move it down here, right? So we end up moving a lot of things around. Um, and so I personally don't really do development in our markdown. I do, I, I create like our markdown skeletons. I do a lot of the work in our scripts, save those as objects, and then I import them into my R markdown. Um, and I'll kind of, I will talk about that more this afternoon after a lunch break. Um, we'll actually go quite in depth into doing that and we'll actually do one ourselves. But I feel like that's more of like the actual process of how most people do their work is that they have an idea, they start developing something in like an R script, and then they say, okay, now I have kind of like the, all of the, like the plots, I have like the tables that I want, I have like all of the information that I know I need in my report. Now I'm gonna actually build my report and slot everything into where it needs to go. Um, so in my opinion, that's like a, a better way to do it, um, but there's nothing wrong whatsoever. When I first started coding, I actually, I didn't actually touch an R script until, um, I was probably coding for almost a year before I even touched an R script. I did all of my development, all of my coding in R Markdown. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, I think most people start in R script uh, here just because that's how the introduction to R uh, um, workshop and you know that's how it's taught. Uh, but I started in R Markdown. So this is actually like, I, I learned probably opposite for most people here. Um, but yeah, so we'll go into like how to go from R script to R Markdown right now we're just going like plain R markdown. So again, uh, there's some caveats to this. So for example, let's say, let's say, so, okay. So let's look right here, right? In my environment, I have this data uh, object, right? So it's here, I have a data set. So what happens if I say like, I just want to get a summary of my data, right? And I try to run this. So that will work. Um, but if you notice like, it, it came up in the console, right? So that's really good. What happens when I try to knit? Error in object, object of type closures, not da, 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 so on, summary, da, 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 da. So why did it throw an error? Well, the reason it threw an error is exactly what I was just talking about. It's sequential, right? So I haven't actually read in the data yet. I read in the data in this chunk down here. So even though the object exists in my environment, everything is where it's supposed to be, um, I haven't actually read in the data yet. So it's not going to be able to run up here. But if I run it, say, down here, underneath where I've read in the data, and then I tried to knit, ah, now it works beautifully. Um, so something to keep in mind is like, so here's a, here's a summary for our data. Uh, here we have like NAs, so you, have, you know, multiple NAs and stuff. Um, so something to think about is that you have to work sequentially, you have to work logically uh, going from top to bottom. Um, and you can't, you can't call an object or you can't, um, what I, does everybody know what I mean when I say call an object? Uh, you can't um, try to use something that you haven't created further on in your, in your, in your, um, in your coding space, if that makes sense. And if it doesn't, somebody please, please let me know. This is all super important stuff, kind of just like with the functionality of R Markdown. Um, and it'll make your lives a lot easier when you're like knocking your heads, like, why isn't this working? And it's just because you have like um, an object that you've called above when in reality you didn't read the data in until like further below, if that makes sense. Um, and if you notice this um, error message that we got, it's not really that intuitive. Um, where did the error message go? There you go. Okay. Well, let's throw it back up here. So just so you can look at it. Um, 
the, the error message that we get when we do something like this, it's not actually intuitive, in my opinion. Um, error in object, double bracket I, type of object closure is not susceptible, uh, calls anonymous with, well, like, what does that even mean, right? Like execution halted. So we can see where the error occurred in line 13. Um, so our markdown does like a really good job of showing you where the errors happen. And then if you double click on error messages, it'll actually take you to the line where the error started. So if the error is in a chunk, which probably 90% of the time it will be, it'll take you to the beginning of the chunk. So it doesn't actually tell you what line what the error occurred in, which can be really frustrating because you're like, I have this code chunk that's like maybe 70, 80 lines long. Um, and it just takes me to like the beginning of the, of the code chunk. Uh, which is another reason why development in our markdown can be really frustrating because you can't like you can't be very specific as to where the errors are occurring meanwhile if you're doing like an r script it can tell you like it happened on line 237 for example very specifically where the error occurred um, does that make sense to everyone yeah data is a function name in r summary df example gives better error messages Ah, perfect. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. Uh, data is a function. Yes, makes sense. Yeah, thank you, Chris. That's a really good point. Yeah, so like Jupyter Notebooks can be run out of order, and that can lead to really strange bugs. Um, so it's a blessing and a curse, um, which is, you know, so probably why I started in R Markdown, or the people that were teaching me started me in R Markdown, because uh, it was much easier to like you can screw things up really, really badly by creating like 20 different objects in different places and then manipulating things like out of order, um, which for a beginner would be kind of confusing. Uh, you can imagine, right? Discipline over convenience every time for me. Yeah, Chris, fair enough. Absolutely. Okay, cool. So with that, uh, we're kind of done with the plot section and we're going to get into inline coding, which is like probably... Um, one of the cooler parts of what we're going to be talking about. So some inline code is basically when we use our, our, our code inside of like commentary. So we do that by using our backticks. So three backticks and three backticks along with curly brackets make a chunk, right? Like the one we have above. If we just use one tick, does everybody know what I mean by backticks? It's not a quotes. Quotes are different. So you have like um, double quotes, right? You have single quotes, and you have backticks. Um, on my um, on my keyboard, it's next to the one, the top left. If that helps, uh, I'm using an English keyboard um, as well, so not an American keyboard. Um, under the escape key, yes. To the left of the one under the escape key, yes. Um, so we use the back tick um, to do inline coding. So what we can do is we can um, specify something as code, and we just do that with two ticks. So um, for example, if I want to talk about a specific thing, um, let's say I have uh, my month variable. So I can say month in the data set is uh, the month that the hourly calls occurred in, for example, right? Left of the Z on a Mac keyboard. Thank you, Andrew, much appreciated. Uh, yeah, left of the Z on a Mac, left of the one on a, uh, on a Windows. So yeah, so this is how we define a code chunk. And you'll see what that looks like. Or not a code chunk, an inline code chunk. Yeah, let's call it inline code chunk. I'm not sure what the official name for it is, to be completely honest with you. But you see here, um, yeah, it doesn't look any different, but it is, I promise. And you'll see what that looks like whenever we, we, we well, let's just knit now. Let's see what this looks like. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh -huh. I haven't removed this uh, error that we did on purpose. So you see here, if you notice, it's like highlighted in the back. And it kind of has like a different font. So say month, 
So we're talking about some sort of like code aspect. So this is something that happens really often when people are talking about code while doing some sort of commentary. Um, and that's kind of how you do like really simple um, inline code in the sense that you're defining something as, as code. Um, so if we want to actually use code in our commentary, we can do that as well. And we do that by doing the same backtick, but we specify the language. So in this case, we specify R, and then we can use functions in our, uh, in our, um, uh, in our, uh, I'm blanking here, in our, our markdown file uh, or in our commentary. So in this case, we're just gonna do n row, which just lists the numbers of row, and we're just gonna put data there. Um, so this data set has, n row data, right? So if we go in our console here, and we just run n row data, see 2,880. So that's the number of rows it has, right? So this data set has, and we should see 2,880 here, uh, rows in the data set. And we can hit that, we'll see what happens. Okay, well, that's cool. See, instead of saying, our n row data, we actually have 2,880, which is the correct um, return for that, for that function, right? So we can mix and match a lot of the stuff that we've been learning. And let's say we want to like bold this, right? So we can knit again. And we can see that now that number is bolded, right? So we can mix and match a lot of like the functionality that we've been talking about to create really uh, uh, intuitive and insightful commentary um, in, in our reports, which is, can be really, really useful um, for, for readers. It can be really useful for pretty much anyone uh, who's kind of looking at our stuff. So that's cool. Well, what's even cooler is that we can incorporate this into things, not only the markdown, we can incorporate this into the YAML. So we can create like dynamic YAMLs, for example. So the date section here, is the date that it was created. But what if I don't want the date it was created? What if I want like the run date of a report? Ah, great question. What we can do is we can remove this uh, using uh, the cut uh, shortcut. So control X or command X on a Mac. And we can just come down here. Um, let's just go above header here. Yeah, let's do that. And to create a YAML, we just define it as a YAML, right? So we use these three dashes on the top and the bottom. So dash, 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 enter, enter, dash, 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 right? And we paste our date. So now we have this like little YAML section here, right? And, and we have our date. So instead of having date, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do some inline code. We're just gonna do R and we're just gonna use the function uh, today, right? So today is a function that's located in the Lubridate package and it returns today's date. So if I were to like get to a point where I automated this report and I ran it, right? Instead of returning like the date that it was created, it would return a run date. So then I could say like uh, this date, this report was run on, on so-and-so date um, or um, yeah, something to that effect. Does that make sense to everyone? So if we knit this, you can see here, um, I made this yesterday, um, so it had the date for, I think, yesterday, uh, and now it has it, the date for today, um, because we use the today function in Luberdate. Um, and we can do the same thing with, like, the title, so if there's, um, like, a, like, a specific team, when we start talking about parameterized reports here after lunch, um, if there's, like, we want to use the, um, like, certain in parameter inputs, we can manipulate, like, the title, so there could be, like, a data pack for this team or data pack for that team, depending on what we input as, as, as a team that we're looking at. Um, so we can do a lot of really cool stuff like that and really um, automate a lot of like the dross of kind of stuff like this, uh, like naming files and, uh, or renaming files, moving things around even, um, renaming titles of our report, fixing dates, et cetera, et cetera. So we can automate a lot of that using this inline coding functionality. Does anybody have any questions about inline coding?
I have a quick question about what you just did with the date. I've got the I've left the date at the top um, as hard coded and then put the date in at the bottom where the way you had with the, the YAML, but it then changed my date at the top. So is it that is that part of the fun of the sequential? Yes, exactly. So it's gonna it's gonna run the most it ran the first thing, but then it was overwritten by the second thing. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah. And another thing is that I have this date here underneath where we read in our packages, right? So today is part of the Lubridate package, right? So if I didn't run my packages, like if I were to put this up here, uh, right? What would happen? Oh, we get an error um, in line two because today hasn't been like there's no function called today because we haven't loaded the package yet, if that makes sense. Um, so a lot of this manipulation needs to happen underneath your R setup chunk, where you load in your packages, you're reading your data, all that kind of, that, that, that first kind of look stuff that you should be doing uh, when, you're, when you're developing reports. Does that make sense to everyone? So that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover um, in terms of the actual, um, reporting structure and like markdown can inline code be multi-line what do you mean by multi-line jamie our code here more code here absolutely so if i were to say like this data set has uh, n row data rows in the data set and it has um R and and columns data. Right? So you can put as much inline code as you want into your RMD. You can make it as uh, dynamic as you want it to be. So you can create a very static report where there has it has none of this functionality, right? Very simple, very straightforward, or you can use more complex code within a single. Oh yeah, you can do you can do literally anything. Um, so if I want to, for example, um, yeah. So um, let's see um, data and then group by. Um, Maybe we should just do filter for it easier. So I, yeah, so I can do like a filter um, our star equals zero. Um, uh, month equals January. And I just pull um, uh, pull out first row all right that's a bit more intense but yeah so something like this for example um so this would be like the count of our start one in or the first row of the data set after i filtered it down to the hour start being zero so between midnight and one in the morning and the months being january Close after January. Uh, yes, thank you. Much appreciated. Cool. Uh, cool. And do things that aren't single line. Uh, yeah, so this theoretically, right, if you want to kind of like, I guess put it like that, right? Sign multiple variables, big for loop, et cetera. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing a large for loop in something like this. I would say if you want to do something like that, I would do it in a chunk. And then once you've done it in the chunk, um, you save it as an object. And then you call that object inside of uh, um, your inline code, if that makes sense. I think the key thing is if you return one thing, you can do it. Yes, exactly. I mean, I agree with you. I don't think it's a very good idea to have massive inline code because it's just hard to read. 
Yeah, you could good. theoretically call a massive amount of code as long as it just returns one thing and doesn't do anything else. I'm getting some errors here. Yeah. Yeah, so yes, yeah, theoretically you can do it. It's not working for me right now for whatever reason, which is fine, it doesn't really matter. But yes, you can do it. But as Chris and I am recommending, we, uh, yeah, I wouldn't do that. I would instead um, do something in the chunk, save it as like an object. So maybe I should do it up here, it's probably better. Uh, filter our start equals zero, month equals uh, January. Take a look at that. Cool. So then, if we just do this and pull, why is it not working? That's weird. Okay. Uh, anyways, so yeah, so theoretically we could then like grab just this one or something and then save that. Um, sorry, now I'm like, no, I'm. I'm dedicated to doing this yeah so there you go this one so then now if like we wanted to do that then we can pull and just say like uh this data set has zero calls for the first line it, between midnight and uh one in the morning in january and then change zero we would just do this one with the bar in the front. Yeah, exactly. Something like that. Um, so yes, you can do multi-line code. Um, like that's kind of how you do like multi-line code or you can do it in a chunk, save it as an object and then call it inside of your inline code, which is what I would recommend doing uh, because doing like really intense code in an inline chunk is probably not. Um, it's not the safest thing to do. It's not super readable. Um, so yeah, cool. So with that, it's noon. Um, so what we're going to do is now that we've kind of talked through all of this, you have some resources, you have kind of this example uh, stuff to play with. What I want you guys to do is go back to my analysis. Okay. Um, and I want you guys to uh, just play around with the data a bit and try to just build like a really simple R Markdown report. Uh, we're going to take 20 minutes to do this. Um, maybe, maybe very, maybe 30. And then we'll take um, like a 25, 30 minute lunch break. Does that sound good to everyone? Or would you rather shorten the, the, like you doing it on your own uh, and have a longer lunch break or would you have like shorter of both? You guys let me know what you guys think. If not, then we'll probably just do like 20, 30 type thing. So 20 to work on you guys on your own and then 30 minute lunch break. Um, if nobody says anything. 2030 is fine. Yes, Joe, I can give that to you. Um, that's weird. Um, okay, cool. Okay, so then let's do this. Um, if that's fine, then I will which puts us back at 1255, 2035, yeah. So right before 1, 1255, uh, we'll do 20 minutes. I'm gonna be here obviously to kind of like help anybody that wants help, I'm gonna help Joe quickly. Um, and then uh, 30 minutes for a quick lunch break, um, quick you know refresh and, and come back. And then if anybody wants to showcase kind of what they did in the time that we had, um, then we'll take maybe, five, 10 minutes to, if anybody wants to show off uh, what they've been able to achieve. 
So I will say that um, in the data section, like I said before, there's two data sets. One is the clean one, which is TOA underscore data. And then there's also the, the dirty version, which is a time of access January through April uh, 2021. So if you're a bit more proficient in R and you want a bit more of a challenge, uh, feel free to use the dirty version and clean it up and do that whole process of like bringing in data, doing some of like the data cleaning and stuff like that in our markdown and then uh, building your, uh, your your plot, your visualization um, in that report, uh, just so you can practice. Um, and if you're not feeling super comfortable with that, then feel free to use a clean version um, and do some of that. I'm getting started when I'm trying to clean from my eyes, excuse me. Air path and just Path does not exist. Okay, cool. I will let you guys go with that and I will start working on some of these questions. Uh, Joe, I will get to you in one second. Um, Romanus, at the top, is there this knitter options? Is that, do you have a hash in front of it? Okay, cool. So Joe, so to get to where we are, Joe, do you have, um, are you here? Do you, do you have access to this space here? Yes. Okay, you have access to this space. And then when you click new project and new RStudio project, it shows up with no files. Is that what you said? I didn't do the new project before, so I just opened up the new project now. It's just deploying it. There. Okay, yeah. So, so if you come to this space and then you click new project and you click new R Studio project, that should give you access to like the cloud repository and all of the files and everything. I can't hear you very well, Joe. What was that? Sorry, which um, folder is this? In? So, okay, so this doing right uh, now. TOA data here. Perfect. Yes, yeah. So if you just create a new RMD file, um, that's basically what everybody's working from, and then you just call it my analysis. And that'll just live in like the base repository. And then you can kind of pull from data. So because, let me uh, maybe just say this to everyone as well. So uh, I never told anybody to move my analysis like anywhere. So it should be in your project folder. If that's the case, then you don't need to do like the double full stops to come out of a, uh, of a folder because you're not in a folder, you're in the base repository. Um, so you should just be able to do, um, for example, uh, just like read underscore XLSX um, and then just list your like file paths. So you should like data TOA, uh, what is it? TOA data. Yeah, so that should work. So you don't need like any of like the additional stuff at the beginning. We only need that stuff because um, we were inside of a different folder, but in this case, everybody should be living in like the base project directory. So you shouldn't need that. Um, does that help anybody that might be having issues already? Hopefully it does. So yeah, cool. I'm going to turn off my uh, my camera and I'm going to mute myself. And if anybody needs anything, just pop something in the chat or shout. Um, and I'm still going to be here. I'm just going to take a quick. Uh, 10 seconds to uh, recover emotionally. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, appreciate it. Thank you guys.
Hi, everyone. Um, so that was 20 minutes. I'm going to go back super fast. Um, but we're going to go on our kind of 30 minute lunch break now. Um, I won't be around like my computer per se, as I'll be having lunch, as I'm assuming most of you will. But feel free to keep working on this as you're eating or just take a break in general. I know it's a lot of information. Um, we'll do like a very quick summary um, after we come back, like kind of maybe before or after we kind of show off what you guys have done, if anybody wants to share. If not, then we'll just do that summary then. Um, but yeah, we'll just do like a quick uh, five, 10, 15 minute summary about everything that we've covered so far, because I know it's a lot of information and uh, just to catch anybody up who might still be uh, uh, a bit behind. Um, if you are a little bit behind, please, please do uh, let me know um, and we can catch you up uh, maybe while we're doing the showcase or just in the summary, if there's like specific things that you want me to like just quickly touch over again, um, that'll be the time to let me know. So that way I can make sure everybody's on the same page as we move into parameterization. And then again, as we move into um, like using functions to automate our, our markdown reports. Um, so definitely really, really important as we're kind of building into kind of slightly more advanced topics. Um, so please do let me know. Have a good lunch.
everybody. Hopefully we're all slowly coming back. Um, <clears throat> just probably give it another minute or so while people are kind of coming back from lunch. Anybody have anything good for lunch? I'm having Subway, but it's on route. Ah, nice, Chris. Subway's always good. I had a really nice potato soup. It's quite delicious. Chinese, nice. Awesome. <clears throat> Should we... Same old boring Sarnies. I don't even what is I don't, what is that? I don't even know what that is, Judy. Anybody else know? Sa oh, that's definitely very different from a sandwich. <laughs> uh, yeah, cool. Awesome. Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, great to have you all back with us. Um, and to those who might have joined in for the afternoon. Um, yeah, so does anybody? make any progress on their analysis that they'd like to share they feel comfortable doing that or anybody want to just kind of like this is what i did this is really cool or maybe some like things that you tried and maybe didn't work and we can kind of maybe take five ten minutes to kind of work through why it might not have worked and how to fix it type thing um, that might be even more useful than um if somebody does something really well if somebody did something if somebody wasn't able to do something then we can fix it and kind of talk about some maybe common issues that you might encounter while using our markdown. Um, does anybody want to do that? Or is there any, anybody face any troubles? If not, that's completely okay. We can just go over a summary of everything up to now, and then we'll start on uh, parameterized reports. Um, so we'll start getting into the kind of the more advanced topics of the day. <clears throat> um, so just kind of as an overview again, uh, after we talk about uh, parameterized reports, we'll go into um, functions for our markdown automation, which I think is like what everybody's probably really excited about. Um, and I'm going to try to explain things really, really well. Uh, Romanus, yeah, yeah, definitely Romanus. Uh, so I'm going to try to explain something really, really um, well, but if I don't explain something well, or if it needs help with something, then please let me know. Uh, Romanus, let's see. I'm gonna make you, I'm gonna make you a co-host. So you can share your screen, and then while okay. you're uh, while you're sharing your screen, I'll stop sharing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm um, sharing my screen. Answer, Something really small. I'll answer Jamie's question while you're getting that already. So Jamie uh, summarizes grouped output by month date. You can override using keeps showing up. Um, in your chunk, did you do uh, your message equals false, all capitals, like this? Yes. Um, interesting. Well, uh, did you do echo equals false? Yep. Interesting. I'm relatively certain I've actually had that happen to me before. Can you share, uh, Romanus? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, but I'm, I don't know why I'm, I'm having trouble with it. Um, share screen. It's not picking the screen that I want for some reason. Does it work at all? Yeah, I, we can see your screen. Yeah, looks good. Okay. Can you see the. Um, our studio cloud yes we see your RCD. oh okay cool yeah I've had, I've had a bit of trouble but i was just playing around like um like with gauges so i was trying to see like um in a month was the um sort of daily um average count um so i, I did that by creating uh well these calls that are called you know called you know month and then this call and then it was literally the, the mean um you know, by the month. Um, everything worked fine except for February. I don't know what was going on, but it wasn't giving me. 
Um, but I'll show you, you know, how it looks like. It's literally. It's another very nice chart, something to play it back with. Um, if the scores were different, then it would have been like, you know, like a traffic light system, you know, mm. um, so red on the green. So it was just to play about really. Yeah, that's really cool. Really slick. Thanks for sharing. No um, problem. Jamie, I'm not sure why you're having that issue, Jamie. Um, so let me look into it and then I'll let you know if I figure it out about that. Okay, cool. Um, I'll stop sharing. Yeah, that'd be great. Also, I'm going to thank you for sharing. Appreciate it. Anybody else have something that, like any other issues or, um, uh, yeah, any other kind of interesting things that they might want to share? <coughs> Excuse me. If not, that's completely okay, and we can just keep moving on. Keep on keeping on. Okay, cool. So, okay, we have that my analysis that you guys were probably just working in. Um, you can just close out of that. Let's close out of our uh, data wrangle uh, or data import and wrangle. And now what we're going to do is we are going to open up our parameterized report, RMD. So this is an exercises in parameterized report, the RMD. I'm just going to open that up. Um, should Everything should be kind of ready to go. So I kind of have this uh, graphic here. So if we just knit this, um, <clears throat> we can just kind of take a look at it quickly. Uh, it's a really simple graph with the one that I had before with some like additional like just lines and stuff. Uh, I also have this warning still here. Um, uh, Jamie, and but I don't have that. So let me try. What if I do this? Um, and then let me also do um, echo equals false like that. Yeah, that dot groups equals drop does remove the group ask like the group functionality of group by. Um, so you can try that to remove that message. By when I do message equals false and echo equals false, I don't get that warning message anymore, Jamie. Um, so I'm not sure why that would be happening for you. Um, that's all right. So cool. So what are parameterized reports? Um, <clears throat> so parameterized reports um, is, is really, really simple. Um, basically, uh, it allows you to create kind of like multiple reports with different inputs. So it's like, like um, you guys know what function? Can we get like a raise of hand? Do you guys know how to raise your hand? Um, or like do like a little plus? Who knows what functions are? If, if, if everybody kind of has an idea, then it'll be simpler. Kind of maybe yes, most of us. Okay, so um, let me put it this way. So for those of us that don't know what functions are, so a function is, is, um, it's almost like a shortcut to doing something. So for example, we have a function that's called like sum, right? <clears throat> Message needs to be lowercase. Ah, okay, thank you, Jamie. Awesome. So um, uh, a function is like, um, like a shortcut to doing something. So like, <clears throat> we know that sum, for example, is like one plus two plus three. So that's like a sum, right? or we, we add things up, so that equals six. Um, or we can use the actual sum function, right? We say one comma two comma three, and that equals six, right? Because it's summing all of the things. So a function, essentially, you input some sort of parameter, an argument is what they're called. You have like an argument, you input some sort of value for that argument, and then um, it returns an output with, um, the value that you input into it, if that makes sense. And a parameterized report basically works the same way that a function does. Um, so essentially what we do is we create some arguments for the actual R markdown document. And the way we do that, we just come over here and we just do that. We, so we 
again, we're setting like sub parameters of the actual HTML document. So we need to manipulate our YAML and um, move it to another line, make sure the spacing is correct. Um, and again, kind of from before, well, I was going to do a summary, wasn't I? I should probably do that. Um, yeah, okay, sorry, pause on this. We'll come right back to it. Let's just do a quick summary. So we've talked about the YAML, right? So yet another markup language, as Andrew corrected me on. Um, we have auto-populates the title, auto-populates the author, and it usually auto-populates the creation date. Within that YAML, we have a lot of functionality, right? So we can change like the output type. So from HTML to, uh, to Word, to PDF, to PowerPoint, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we can also manipulate kind of some functionality of the actual report. So adding like a table of contents, section numbering, adding um, code folding, so hiding code, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We also have something called code chunks, right? So that's like the area where we actually do our, our development, our code development. Um, and that's sequential, right? So it has to be in order. So objects that are created at the top are used at the bottom, not, not vice versa. So you can't create an object at the bottom and use it at the top because it will break, it won't work. Um, <clears throat> all our Markdown files uh, by default create in our setup where you can include, um, if you want to change like some sort of working directory, if you want to, um, uh, you know, install packages, read in data, et cetera. Uh, you can also, um, manipulate stuff within Markdown itself. So create headers, create tabs, uh, bold, italics, lists. You can import pictures, you can use hyperlinks, and you can use other languages like LaTeX and like HTML like we did there. Um, uh, finally, you can kind of mix and match Markdown and code with inline code. Um, and you can uh, use you know objects or you can uh, do kind of longer code, uh, code, inline code chunks is what I'll call them to, uh, yeah, to generate some, some really cool stuff and to kind of have like a really dynamic report that refreshes and, and reevaluates based off of maybe new data, maybe if you switch teams. And the parameterized report is kind of a build off of everything that we've been talking about, especially the whole idea of like a dynamic reporting system with like uh, inline code, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> I know that was a really quick summary, five second summary. Um, is there any specific point or part of that that somebody does not understand that they would like me to re-explain? Really, really important because we're starting to move on to like some more advanced uh, concepts, um, like the whole idea of like functionality or functions and like arguments and making sure that like things flow through the system correctly. Um, so is there any questions about that? No? Awesome, okay, I don't see any questions in the chat either. Great, so <clears throat> if you do have a question, please, I'm, I'm being dead serious, let me know. No judgment whatsoever. If you're lost or if you're behind, um, let myself or Chris know, and uh, one of us, well, probably Chris can help you out in catching you up to where we are. Send him like a private message or something uh, so nobody else can see it. If you're embarrassed or doesn't matter, honestly, please, please, please make sure that you're up to, because. The, the point of this is that you can build autom automated reports, right? So if you aren't understanding something, please do, uh, because it's really important now. Cool. So everybody with me? Great. So again, unpause, parameterized reporting. So like I was saying, and like we were just talking about, you can manipulate the YAML to, um, uh, yeah, to create parameters and some parameters. So we're going to create some uh, parameters, right? Some arguments that we're going to use to manipulate dynamically our, our markdown file. And we do that with the YAML. So uh, we're going to do it like we did before. We're going to click enter at the beginning of the HTML document and we're going to click tab to get it in the correct line spacing. We're going to give that a colon. <clears throat> then we're going to click enter again. So once we do that, um, well, actually, I'm so sorry. I'm lying. Hold on. We actually don't need to do that. So params, we're just going to input it underneath the HTML document there. Once we've done that, we're now defining uh, subcomponents of the parameters like section. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna input a parameter called month. And the, the default is gonna be October. Oh, I need to stop trying it. Interesting, okay. Everybody's gonna get this, error, this message here. Everybody needs to click install. And we'll just wait like 
30 seconds. Well, that installs. That's my fault again. Apologies. <coughs> Uh, okay, hopefully that'll come through soon. So we're gonna make our default month January. So what happens, oh, there it is. Everybody should get this little thing in jobs where it's installing and this little thing here. <coughs> so, okay, cool. So uh, once that's installed, um, don't show again, because we don't need it, right? Um, so now what we can do is we have this knit button here that we've been pressing, right? We can click this little down, uh, like pick list type thing, uh, like to create, you know, whatever. And we can come down here to knit with parameters and we can click on that. And we have this little box that shows up. And if you see here, it says month January, right? <clears throat> so that's cool. So we, we're knitting with parameters with the month being January. So we can change this to say, oh, uh, that was interesting. I think it clicked enter on accident. Um, which it won't do anything because I haven't done anything with the parameters yet. Um, let's go out here. Sorry about that. So we can type this in as January. Uh, we can, oh my goodness, I keep pressing enter. Sorry, the enter key on my keyboard is really fat. It's really long. Um, so like if I misclick my backspace slightly, it'll click the enter. Um, yeah, or we can click February, <coughs> March, so on and so forth. So cool, okay. So now we've created this parameter called month and we've set the default to January. So what do we what do we do with this? Ah, well, good question. So what we can do with this is we can use it to manipulate our data set. So what we're going to do is we're gonna come down here and the first thing that we did was we run in our data set, right? And everybody should have the same thing here because I've already, this is something that I gave to you. So we're all like working off like the same information. And again, this is parameterized report. So what we're going to do is we're going to say dat, as in like we're going to recall or rename the object the same thing basically, and we're going to do a quick filter, right? And we're going to filter our month as params dollar sign month. <clears throat> so what does this mean? Well, it means that we're going to take the data set and then we're going to filter it so that the month column is only equal to the params month. So in this case, the default is January. So when we run knit with parameters, and we make sure this is spelled correctly and we click knit. What happens? Well, we filtered out all of our data to only January. We can do something similar with, if we knit, knit with parameters and we change this to February and we click knit. <clears throat> really cool, huh? So if you see here the month's February, et cetera, et cetera. So we can do this with any month and we can literally parameterize any variable or any column, excuse me, that we want. So. As you could imagine, uh, the majority of times this is used on like, like factor type variables. So like if there's multiple groups, so let's say you have like a clinical team and you want to create multiple different reports for each clinical team. Um, obviously, maybe you don't want all of their uh, information in one report. You want to create an individual one for each one. And this might be a really good way of doing that, right? Because you can create um, kind of dynamic reports and filter the whole data set off of the, um, the parameter. Uh, and then we'll talk about a way to like automate this process so that way it generates like multiple reports off of like one command, which is really cool. So we'll talk about that in a bit. So, okay, great. So we have that functionality and that's really, really good, obviously. But we want to um, maybe add some functionality to, uh, to, to the list because it's like kind of dull, right? Like you have to input the, the, the month and then you have to kind of like manipulate it and... Um, like if you saw it, when I knit, it leaves it with like um, the previous one. So February is still there, even though January is the, so that's kind of annoying. So we're going to change it a little bit. What we're going to do is we're going to erase this. We're going to click enter 
and that should automatically lead you to like a new little subsection of the parameters. So we're in the param section in the month parameter, and then we're doing some like underneath that even more, we're having like some additional sub parameters or sub arguments, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say label, and we're gonna call this uh, month of the year. And so this is the label that's going to show up whenever we're doing the actual like knitting to with parameters, right? So before it was just like months, which was the name of the actual like parameter itself. But now we're creating like a label for it. So we're kind of cleaning up the actual look of it. So like functionality type thing. Let's say you share this document with somebody else and that like you want to make it very clear of what things are, you can set labels, etc. cetera. Uh, we're also going to set a default value. So in this case, our default value is going to be January. Um, and we actually don't need quotes here. So apologies on that. <clears throat> And then our input, uh, there's multiple different input types that we can do. You can do sliders if it's like numerical. So if we had like multiple years, in this case, we don't, it's only 2021. Um, but if we had multiple years, we could do a slider and set like a year parameter where we could uh, like manipulate what year it's from, or uh, maybe the, if there's like a, a minimum and a maximum year, then we could do something like that. Or if it's quarterly, then we can uh, do quarters or uh, and a year and then you can like manipulate the or you can filter off of the quarter and the year or something to that effect in this case uh in this case we're just going to use a select input and so it's just like a pick list basically and then because we've selected select we're going to add in our choices and this is going to be in brackets so we're going to do january uh february march and april Let's see some questions here Uh, so Chris said, just for interest, you can allow users to alter the parameters of R-Mark and documents through a Shiny interface. And I cover this in the Shiny workshop coming up in a few weeks. Yes. So whenever we knit with parameters, uh, my knit with parameters keeps saying connection refused. I've never seen that before, Susan. Um, so maybe Chris can help you with that. I've actually literally never seen that before. Interesting. Chris has Chris is asked, yeah. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. So. Uh, this so the reason that if you if you remember uh, when all of us is so here we loaded like this part package shiny, so like Chris was just saying this is technically like a mini mini shiny dashboard like oh we're messing with shiny right, but that's what it is. So we see here we've added all this functionality. Okay, now we have like this really nice label right. Our uh, default or what should be our default should be January, which wasn't, which is interesting. Uh, but we have this like select input and we have our choices, right? So now we can just kind of pick list. So that way, um, let's say, again, you're passing it off to a colleague or something, or you're even creating the reports yourself. Um, there's no concerns about like potential typos or anything like that because you have a pick list with all of the, like the team names or the months or the years, et cetera, et cetera. So there really shouldn't be any issues. So now we can kind of knit this, we can change the months to uh, whatever we want them to be which is really nice and adds like another level of uh, functionality to a report. <clears throat> so that's like a really simple look at parameterized R markdown. Um, does anybody have any questions about that? No? Cool. So, um, yeah, so okay, so we have, let's see, three hours. Um, question maybe? Can we send us a copy of this recording? Yes, I believe it's gonna be posted on YouTube. Um, so it should be there. Um, I'll just quickly kind of like cover this over again. And then we're gonna start getting into like a bit more of like the nitty gritty, like actually automating these reports. Because right now, right, we're still clicking like this knit. And then we're clicking the knit with parameters and stuff like that. So we're doing a lot of clicking still, right? Um, so yeah, so we'll go over kind of how to like streamline that process completely. And we don't really have to like touch anything other than like one button, which would be really nice. Um, so cool. So we have, uh, again, we created this uh, params option in our YAML. Here we define our, um, our variable of like, or our parameter of interest in this case, it's month. And then we set a bunch of like options for that variable. If I were to create another one, say hour, right? I would need to be on the same line as month. You see here, this is on the same line. And so that's now created another, uh, 
another another parameter in my parameterized document. And then I can change uh, our start of the day. Um, and then I can say value uh, is zero input, maybe like a slider, um, sorry, colon, slider. Um, and then, yeah, I can set my min is zero, max is 23. Knit isn't working for me either. <clears throat> isn't it working for everyone? Or am I just being like really dense? Can you guys let me know? Because if it's not working for people, then it's not good. Works for Jamie, okay. Working fine for me from Joe. Works for me, works fine. Okay, All right. Um, getting a great box, fine for me too. Oh, um, maybe you haven't installed Shiny yet, Tina. Um, so there's like a little yellow warning up here at the top that says you haven't installed Shiny, then you probably need to do that. Um, if there's no little yellow box up at the top, then just come down here and say install dot packages um, shiny. Okay, great. Was that was the little box there? Is that what it was? Okay, I'm going to assume yes because I have no idea. Okay, cool. Um, and then yeah, once we have that, we can introduce like a step. So if I want to skip two, then I can step two, right? In this case, uh, it's hourly start, so we only want one. Um, uh, yeah, so that's kind of, so if we look at knit with parameters again, we should have a little, another little section. So here we have like hours of the day. Oh, cool. So now we can set like, um, you know, which hour we want. Um, okay, I didn't see this so same too. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so now we can like set like multiple parameters. So you can add as many parameters as you want based on the needs of your report, right? Which is really, really nice. Um, and that all goes inside of the YAML. Um, cool. So. And then again, um, to use those parameters inside of your report, you do params, dollar sign, and then you should see all of your parameters. So in this case, it was months before, it was the only one. And uh, now I created an hour parameter. So now we have an hour here. Uh, and so that will be populated by whatever I input in my, in my parameterization. Does that make sense to everyone? Does anybody have any questions? Other than if it's not working. Anybody, anybody? Going once, going twice, sold. Great, awesome. You guys are, you guys are stars. Okay. Are the params option in the link? What do you mean, Judy? So if you see, can you knit with params to PDF or Word? Ah, great question. I've never tried. I um, are the params option in the link? Oh, okay, the params. Oh yes, let me link the params. So this is like the actual R markdown bit. I think you can knit to Word. So I know you can definitely knit to everything, obviously. Um, but knit with parameters, I'm not sure because I've never actually tried it, Andrew. That's a really good question. Um, I will, I don't know, maybe after the workshop, I'll try it and then just let you know. Um, or you can try it right now yourself if you're following along really well. Um, yeah, Chris is saying he's pretty sure that you can. Cool. Uh, yes, you can. I knit to PDF. Okay. Yeah. Wayne is saying that it is possible. Awesome. Cool, so great. So a step even higher than this, right? Um, so now we've run this report, we've knitted it, we've done parameters, right? We know how to like call our parameters within the R, R Markdown document. Um, you can also use like inline code as well. So if you want to um, say like params uh, month, it'll be like, uh, we used params month in this report. Um, and then if we knit with parameters and then, uh, yeah, we just do April and we said it's like six. We haven't actually done anything with hour. So it's not gonna filter on hour or do anything like that, um, but it will for months. So if we look, 
uh, down at the bottom, right? We used April in this report. So that's an example um, of, of that. So uh, Wayne is putting up a really, really good point. So one of the main reasons that I'm not covering PDF uh, or Word um, or PowerPoint in this uh, presentation or in this workshop is because uh, sometimes when you have to, when you knit to PDF or knit to Word or knit to, uh, to, to, to PowerPoint, there's like some additional programs you might have to download. Um, so like, or if you have Java issues, like your Java connection is really important when you're doing like PDF. Or PDF is also really important as like LaTeX. Um, and so you have to do like a lot of like additional, like tit, in my opinion, like really like nitpicky things that just get really um, annoying to deal with uh, in like a workshop setting, right? Um, I mean, I could set it all up, but it would take a while probably. Um, so maybe in the future for a more advanced workshop, we'll do um, everything else. But anyways, um, thank you, Wayne and, and Andrew for pointing that stuff out. Um, much appreciated. Uh, so yeah, so, okay, great. So now we've learned kind of how to do parameterized reporting and it seems relatively simple. Like it's really straightforward, right? Okay, great. Well, what, it, like, it's really annoying having to, you know, open this report and then clicking it with parameters like four different times and then every time, like it overwrites itself. So if I want to create like five different reports and I want to keep them all saved, um, it, it won't do that, right? Because it's it's overwriting itself every time, uh, which is maybe not a good thing, right? Because we want to keep like historical records of what we're doing. And if I've already run a report, then I have to like rename it, like go into my file di directory and rename it and then create the report again and then rename it. And that just gets really annoying. Um, and that's what we're trying to eliminate, right? It's like all that time. So that's like, yeah, it only takes like five seconds to run this report because it's super small. But imagine you have like a relatively long report um, and you run it, maybe it takes like two minutes or maybe like one minute and a half or a minute, but then you have to like move it from a, a location to a different location. You have to rename it. And then you have to you know do all this stuff. And then you have to go back and you do it over and over again, maybe five, six times for different clinical teams that you have. So it, you know, it can add up to maybe you know half an hour that you end up spending on something that in my opinion should take five minutes. So that's what we're gonna talk about now. How do we use some of the R markdown functions and some like additional um, like for loop functions to, uh, to run these reports kind of um, on the fly or automatically or auto automated basically. Great, so let's all close this one. Let's close our parameterized report.rmd. And we're going to open up uh, master control. Just kidding. Where's that at? Uh, RMD function automation dot R. So this is an R script, right? So we're kind of moving away from not moving away from RMD, but we're um, doing something a little bit different with it um, in the sense that we're changing the the approach, if you will. So instead of having like to knit every single time that we want to run something, let's imagine that we already have like a report that's like worked out all the kinks, everything's good. Uh, and we just want like an outside thing to run it. So we don't have to keep touching it. So uh, I don't know how, and this is kind of where it gets a bit more advanced. So um, let's just start with this. So first of all, um, in our markdown, there's a function called render. So let's just look at the help file and see what this function does. So render our markdown. So it renders the input file to the specified output, output format using pandoc. If the input requires knitting, then knit is called prior to pandoc. So essentially what happens is um, the render function knits an RMD file, uh, which is really, really good because um, you can, if you can put a knit function or like a knit function into your actual RMD file, but I don't recommend that um, just because if you're doing development or something in it, then you can accidentally run it on it. You can accidentally run it. Or if you knit at the top, like with the button and you have like a knit function within your RMD, then you can like double knit and that'll crash your R studio. Um, so let me tell you how I use this. Um, so, as I kind of mentioned earlier today, how I do this is I usually have like some sort of data source like SQL, for example. And I know in like the introduction to R workshop, they talk about using SQL to like pull data into R. 
And so that's what I usually do. So I usually pull from SQL to R, to an R script to be specific. From there, I do all my data wrangling and object creation. Um, and then I go into RMD and I build like a skeleton of my R markdown of what I want it to look like. And then I, after I've saved all those objects in my R script, I just transfer them over to uh, my R markdown. And then I just run a render function at the very end of my R script. Um, so instead of having to like open up my RMD and knit, um, I just open up like a master R script. And then I just use a command uh, or a shortcut command, uh, control shift enter, which runs everything in the report. So it automatically pulls in the data, um, creates all of the graphs and tables, et cetera, et cetera, and then runs the render file uh, with the specified R markdown, um, uh, you know, R markdown file that is like the skeleton of that report. Um, and then it returns that um, and then I'm done. I also have like some additional functionality that like sends out emails automatically and stuff, but we're not gonna get into that. There's a step above that even where you can create something called a, a dot, uh, a bat file or a batch file. Um, and that will like run your R script. So, and you, and you can set that up in like task scheduler. So then you would literally wouldn't have to open R whatsoever um, to open or to, to run your reports. Like you could set it on a scheduler. And then as long as your uh, laptop was on, it would automatically run your report um, on, on like the background. You wouldn't have to touch anything. You wouldn't have to do anything. And it would be like completely 100% automated. Again, we're not going to go into that uh, today. Uh, we're just going to go into like the step below that. So like using the R script to automate everything and then get there. So uh, we're going to build to that. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to use render to, uh, to run a markdown report from outside of R markdown. And so this is really easy. Um, what we're going to do is we already have this R markdown um, double, double render, uh, double colon. Um, you don't have to do the double colon. It, is optional. Um, you can just use, if you have R Markdown already loaded, uh, you can just do like library R Markdown. Um, in this case, our R Markdown is already loaded, so we don't need to do that, but I'm just gonna leave this here just so you guys know what package it sits in. Uh, because I know we're talking about a lot of packages right now, like R Markdown and Knitter um, and, and you know all of this different stuff. So it, it sits in R Markdown, it basically works like this. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna, um, uh, call the file path. So remember that we're no longer in an RMD file. We're in an R script. So because we're in an R script, remember that stuff around like the project directory. Um, we're not we're not working out inside of exercises anymore. We're working in like the base repository. So we need to go into exercises, um, and we're going to grab our data import underscore wrangle. rmd and we're just going to click command enter so we see here in the console right it ran our report and it generated something um, so it generated our report so that's like a really really simple way of uh of running um an, an rmd inside of our inside of our script so it's literally that simple so if i have everything in my r script if i like to do it there then i can just list this at the bottom of my R script. And then if I just do say uh, control shift enter, that'll automatically run everything in my R script. And then at the very end, I'm gonna have this render function, which calls um, an RMD file, which populates a report that has like all of the objects uh, uh, inside of that. And that's gonna make more sense. We're gonna get to that point again. Um, but that's kind of like a really simple way of how to run an RMD file from an R script. So we can do something similar uh, uh, using render to, to run like a parameterized report. Um, so to do that, I always forget the syntax, I apologize. Okay, we're gonna do our markdown again, right? Render, okay, and this time we're gonna use our parameterized report. So last time we used like just this basic our markdown report, right? That doesn't really have any parameterization. It's a pretty basic kind of thing that we were just kind of looking at. Uh, but now we're gonna use our parameterized report. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing. Um, caps lock, sorry. And we're going to do exercises slash um, parameterized report.rmd, right? 
So if I were to run it just like this, it runs, right? Uh, so great, yeah, that runs really, really good. Um, so let's just, we've run that. Let's just take a look at it, right? So here you see January is filtered. And why is that? Oh, well, it's because we have parameters in there and we've specified the initial value as January. So it's going to filter to January automatically because that's the default, right? That's the default that we set up uh, inside of our, uh, our markdown file. Okay, so cool. Okay, well, what if I want to change that? Ah, great question. So we can say params equals, and we can set a list. And the reason we set a list is because we have multiple um, uh, uh, parameters, right? So in this case, we have two, we have month, and we have um, uh, hour, right? Hour we don't use at all um, in our, just in our report a few times, sorry, just so we can get a better idea of where we are at. Apologies. Uh, but in this case, um, why did we keep doing that? Oh, we stay. Okay. We're going to say month equals, uh, let's go with uh, April. Cool. So it's kind of like static, right? So it's, it's static in the sense that um, we have one parameter and we're specifying it and then we can change it from here. So uh, if I have a parameter that I know that will be used like 99% of the time, then maybe this is the way I want to do it, right? In the render function outside of our markdown, um, I just specify that I, on default, I want April. I mean, it's the same, kind of the same thing as setting the default to April in your actual our markdown report. So there isn't really much of a difference, um, but just let's, you know, kind of letting you know that you can do that. You don't have to specify every single parameter in your report, um, obviously, because we've set those default parameters, right? So it'll work off the default. And if there's anything that's changed, then it'll change it. So if we run this again, um, refresh our thing, uh, if we look in our web browser, we should get April, right? Cool. Does that make sense to everyone? Does anybody have any questions? Questions, questions, questions. No questions, great. Okay, a step above that is actually building a function um, that generates the, the report. Um, so why would we build a function? Well, we'll kind of get to that, but basically the reason we'll build a function is so that we can implement it. Uh, can you put multiple months and get multiple plots? Not this way but we're getting to the point where we can do that, Andrew. And, um, and so that's, the, so everybody can see, can everybody see this question? So can you put multiple months and get multiple plots? Um, so not in the way that we have it right now, right? Because it's, it's, we can't enter a vector here because this is input as a parameter, right? As an argument. What we can do is we can, we can build a function. Uh, uh, maybe render parameterized. Uh, yeah, so let's, and so uh, function building um, is relatively straightforward. Um, we're just going to put months here. Okay. So essentially how it works is I have an argument, right? I define a function, I have an argument, and I give it a name. And then I use these curly brackets, and everything should be going inside of the curly brackets. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're just going to... Um, do our R markdown like before, right? We can actually probably just copy paste this. We're just gonna copy paste this. All right? So cool. So now we have this function here, but we have this month um, argument. I'm gonna call it an argument, not a parameter. And we have the month parameter down here. So whenever we create this, like how we have, um, and this is an example, uh, let's say we have sum, right? We have one, two, three. So one, two, three are all arguments that we're inputting. And the function, um, what am I doing? There's, uh, apologies. The function behind sum, um, if you see here, it's a function. It has dot, 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 comma, any dot, rm, it's false. So this dot, dot, dot is where you input like 
uh, a list of numbers basically. And then it sums all of those numbers. So in this case, our function render parameterized asks for a month to be inputted. Um, maybe we should correct that to like month name, probably even clearer, right? So it's asked, it asks for a month name. And then that month name, instead of saying month equals April, we're gonna say month equals month name, right? So whenever we do that, we're just gonna save it. So you see here, we have this function now that's built and it says render parameterized. So cool. So now if we do render underscore parameterized, now it's look, if you see this little section here, it says render parameterized and it has this uh, parentheses month name. So it's asking for a month name, right? So what month name should, should we give? Uh, let's say March. Um, let's do it in just in case. So now if we do this, that's going to generate a report. That's really cool. And we can look into our web browser and it's March. So now we've like shortened it from this down to this, which is really cool. Um, why is that useful? Well, like Andrew was asking, what if we want to create multiple port reports at the same time? Ah, well, great question. Um, we can use for loops or like for loop like functions to generate um, uh, multiple reports at the same time. So um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create like just a simple list of, of, of month names. And to do that, um, we're gonna just gonna create an object that's my months, right? And we're gonna use this C here, this C function. And what that does is it creates a vector, right? So if we list nothing in it, it's, it's null. But if we do this and then we say January, February, et cetera. Oh, sorry. Then it'll, it'll create this like little vector here that it's like two, two kind of um, strings long, right? And so we're just going to do that for every month that we have in our data set. In this case, we only have four months, January, February, uh, March, April, right? And now we have my month. So if we look at this my months, right, it has four things. So if we look at the first thing inside of my months, it'll be January. The second one will be February. The third one will be March. The fourth one will be April. So we can, does everybody know what a for loop is? before I keep talking about this and I lose everyone. If, if a single person does not know what a for loop is, I need to talk about it. So let me, let me clarify. Does anybody not know what a for loop is? Okay, I'm gonna talk about it because I'm, I'm, I'm certain there's at least one that doesn't know what a for loop is. Okay. So a for loop is, is what it sounds like. It's a loop um, if a condition is present. Uh, no, it's not if a condition is present. So a for loop is, is, um, is when you iterate or you run through something multiple times. So you do something over and over and over again. So in R, uh, whew, let me see if I can remember how to do this. I haven't written one of these in a while. Will that work? Maybe. Let me just crash my R studio. That'd be really funny. Um, oh, there we go. Uh, I've been told that coming off your VPN can solve some problems with the R studio cloud. Sorry, I should know that one really. Um, I'm still connected to my VPN. <laughs> so if there's any issues, apologies. I just forget how to do this. Um, well, we're going to create this thing called my numbers, and we're just going to go one, two, three, four, five, right? And then we're going to come in here and we're going to say uh, print my numbers. 
I. So essentially what happens is, yeah, we should get one through five is what we should get. Or not, which is great. Um, okay, I promise that that's what happened. That's what's supposed to happen. Um, that's really embarrassing. That I can't remember how to do a for loop. That's all right. Anyways, the point is that essentially what should happen is we should get one, then we should get two, then we should get three, then we should get four, then we should get five. The same way that like if I did my months one, for example, it goes January, right? And then if I do uh, my months two, that does February and so on and so forth for as many, however many months that I have, however long my like little compilation of, of strings are, my list of strings um, for I and one through five print. Uh, yes, that's J, thank you. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, so like that, see? So essentially we're printing each, each thing, each I, um, but I doesn't have to be like a number. It can be like a data set, for example. So if I want to do something to every single column, then I can use a for loop to like manipulate every single column um, and convert them say all to numeric. Um, or if I want to um, iterate through rows, I can do that and like compare rows to each other. Um, so it's kind of like the backbone of a lot of like built-in functions and how they work. Um, so in this case, we want to render a separate report for every month. What we can do is we can use a for loop to do that. I'm not going to build a for loop exclusively, but I'm going to use something within the per package um, called map. Okay. And so map does the exact same thing that a for loop would, um, but it's faster and much kind of easier to understand. So for map, all I have to do is enter like a vector of my arguments. In this case, we have our arguments January, February, March, April, and we have to input a function. Um, so if I just do my months here, and then I do render parameterized uh, with no parentheses, no nothing, and I do that, if you see here, three, four. So it rendered four different um, RMD files. So that's pretty cool. So I've just rendered four different RMD files, each one for my given month. But the issue is that they're all named exactly the same thing. So how do I change the name? Oh, well, that we can go back to the render pack. So let's go back to our function up here. We can um, change one of the um, input. We can say output file equals and we can specify like the name of the file that we want output. So let's say like our like uh, RMD file is called like uh, my report one, right? But I have, it's like parameterized and I have like all this functionality and I want it to output um, data pack for this team. Um, then I can do that using this output file thing. If I was actually inside of our markdown, I wouldn't be able to do that because it, it, it um, returns the same file with the same name as the actual RMD file. Do we understand how like the RMD file generates the H like the HTML or the output file? And in R Markdown, they kind of like are mirrors of each other. So everything that you do in R Markdown will get done in the HTML file. But by using this render function, we kind of have like a middle bit where it creates the RMD file and then it can even change some of the components of that RMD file um, to the output file. So it's kind of like a, like a middle point in between um, and, and this is one of those examples. So if we were to change the output file, right? And the cool thing about this is we already have this function called month name, right? So we can use that in our, the rest of our function to change like the name of the file. So if I wanted to call it, um, we're just gonna use a function called paste zero. And so paste zero just like puts things to, puts words together basically. So we're just gonna say uh, parameterized reports report underscore, and we're gonna do a comma, and then we're gonna do month name, right? So if I come down here, just to kind of give me an example of what that looks like, and I say parameterized underscore report, comma, and then I do another thing here, January. So it does parameterized report January, right? 
And if I do parameterized report February, it'll put that name, parameterized report uh, 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 March, it'll do that name, parameters report April, it'll do that name, so on and so forth. And any combination of arguments inside of your function, you can manipulate that name. So I have some reports that have like year, month, day type thing. So that's like all completely automated. So um, I have like um, like a paste zero that says like the name of the report. So like ad hoc 331, uh, the actual name of the report, and then uh, year, month, day, all kind of attached together. And then every time I run that report, it, it uses the inputs from uh, from functions to to build that 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 file name or the HTML name, the actual output. Um, and then uh, I don't have to worry about like renaming anything or things getting overwritten or anything like that because every time I run the report, it always uses the day that it's being run on as the actual uh, like file name itself. So that's really, really useful. The same thing here. Uh, so once we have that, I'm like 99% certain that that'll work 100% fine. Let's just run a single report with the function, right? So if we do that, we should get parameterized report underscore March. And if we look into it, we see March. Great. That means that function is working perfectly. So now if we use the map function to for loop or iterate through this list of, of months, what's going to happen is we're going to have this run four times. And bam, look at that. We have January, February, March, April. So if I have like 20 teams, instead of having to knit and rename and having to move things around and manipulate things over and over and over again, 20 times, instead, all I have to do is create a list of all of the team names, set that as the argument in my parameter, in my, in my function, or set that as the argument for my function, and then make sure that that is correct in like the actual RMD file. And then when that's done, all I have to do is use this one simple function here to run 20 different reports all at once. And then they'll all be named correctly based off of the name of uh, the, the team, for example, if that was something that you were trying to do. Does that make sense to everyone? Is there any questions there? I know that's like kind of complex, but, um, but yes, this is the time. This is definitely the time to ask questions. That's probably uh, one of the most complex things we're going to do today. Well, actually, it is the most, that's like kind of the culmination of everything we've been doing. Does anybody have any questions about that? Anybody think that's really cool? I think that's really cool. I'm just saying. I really like automation like this, and I think that's really cool. Um, so, yeah. So, Okay, cool. And then of course um, we can run all the RMD files in a directory. Uh, I'm just gonna steal this here um, because I don't ever remember the syntax. So if we have like, okay, so let's say, don't know what I don't know yet. Okay, fair enough. If you don't know what to ask, then you don't know what to ask, right? Fair enough. So let's say I have like, okay, Hansel, that's really cool and all, but I still wanna create like, five or six different reports for each one of my teams. Fine, 100% okay. If that's how you wanna do it, and instead of like having to open up each one and knit each one, um, et cetera, what you can do instead is you can use this function here, list.files. What that does is it, um, it lists all of the files inside of your current project. Um, so in this case, uh, it's listing all the files inside of my, um, my exercise folder uh, or inside of like the base project directory, but we actually want to go inside of exercises. So here um, we're just gonna do a quick space and we're just gonna do a quick little there. Uh, that should work. Yeah. So if you see here, um, we did our list.files, right? We entered our exercises folder. And then we said the pattern that we want to look for is .rmd. So we want every file that ends with .rmd. And so in return, if I, you know, I, I named the object files, right? And so if we look at our files, like we just did, 
um, we see we have three RMD files. So if you look at our exercise folder, right, that's exactly how many we have. We have one, we have two, we have three. It's amazing. That's really, really good. Um, so that means that, um, yeah, we can we can run all of the RMD files that we have in a in a folder if we choose to do so. Um, and so then we just can use this function for F and files. And so that's just a really simple for loop. And then we just render everything. Or you can use a map function. Um, if everybody says bye to Chris, he's having to run. Um, so thank you so much, Chris, for your help. Much appreciated. And we will see you soon, hopefully. Our, uh, Chris is giving some really good uh, talks next week. Um, and he's also giving that shiny workshop here in a couple of weeks as well. Um, so yeah, so hopefully we'll catch him. We'll catch him soon. Yes, it will be for sure. Okay, so with that in mind, so yeah, we can run this uh, for F and files, render all the files, basically. Does that make sense to everyone? Is that um, just out of my own personal curiosity, by a show of thumbs, who, who is any of this useful to anyone? Is this like, does this assist you in like automating a lot of the work that you have to do? Now that you know this, would you use it regularly, like like, like regularly to update all of your reports? Um, definitely from Anna. Uh, thumbs up from Wayne. Is this all like, I don't know how like common knowledge some of this is. Obviously, um, a lot of us are kind of more novice users or kind of being kind of introduced to our markdown for the first time or for like the kind of like the intermediate type deal, but. This is something that I actually learned um, relatively recently as well. So um, find some reports with longer narrative sections to find the best value. Yeah, definitely, Joe. So um, this is obviously the most useful. All of this is the most useful if you have like really long reports that are super involved um, and like require a lot. So like the parameterization bit is like super useful then. And then being able to do the list files and run everything is like really nice. So for example, uh, recently I had a request where uh, we have like this whole uh, principal care network deal with the NHS right now, uh, for those of you that know, uh, I don't know who is in the NHS and who's not, but I had to split up almost all of my work into like principal care networks and then send out data packs individually to each one of these. So stuff like this was like super useful because there's 31, 30, 31 data, uh, principal care networks in Devon. Uh, so yeah, being able to do something like this instead of like, for example, if I was doing it in Excel, um, I'd have to, you know, maybe like I have like a base Excel sheet that pivots a bunch of data and then go one by one building every single report individually 30 times. And that would take, you know, hours and hours and hours. Meanwhile, if I do it like this, right, I build one report one time that's parameterized. I input, um, I list some sort of, you know, variable string that has say all of the PCN names. And then I use these functions to, to automate everything. And so then when I run something, it runs 30 different reports, names them all completely different things and I like to do it once. So it's like an amazing time save really. Um, something that could take someone, you know, 20, even maybe 30 hours of work to do, uh, ends up taking the, the time that it takes to do all of like the data management, like the data, uh, pulling in the data, the data wrangling, um, building that one R markdown skeleton. And then from there, just using these really simple functions to run everything. So some really, really cool stuff and some really great functionality. Uh, and then you send individual reports to the data sets to 20, reduces the chance of human error in copying and pasting too. Absolutely, yeah. So a lot of really, really good benefits. So cool. So now that we've done that, um, let's see. We are going to, sorry guys, uh, I'm reaching the end of my workshop. Uh, we're gonna go over kind of one more thing and then we have like some very simple demos that aren't very demo-like, but they're very simple demos that we can kind of show off and kind of go through and talk about how to do certain things maybe. Maybe I can pull up my actual like R script, like my personal um, R studio and show like some of the like functionality aspect of additional kind of automate or not automation packages, but like interactive uh, 
packages or visualizations, et cetera, because I know we still have like quite a bit of time. Um, like I said, this is the first time I'm doing this workshop. So I wasn't exactly sure. I, I tried to plan it out to fill up the entire time, but I think we might be a little bit early. That's okay. Not a bad thing. So uh, let's close that, everybody. And we're just going to come over here to our sequential automation section. Okay. And if it's empty, that's great. That's supposed to be. So we're going to open up the R script and we're going to open up the markdown. Um, so <clears throat> the reason I'm doing this is, again, um, I just want to kind of pound this into you guys, like this whole process that can happen, this really, really simple process. So usually uh, what we're going to do now is we're, well, what we're going to do right now is we're just going to run through as if I was starting a report from scratch. Um, well, I say scratch, I've already cleaned the data, but let's say I was starting a report from scratch and I wanted to build um, something relatively simple, but quickly, and I wanted it to be, to be completely automated. Um, well, well, completely automated to a certain extent. If you do parameterized reports like these, is there a data loss possibility? I use the data for other teams contained in every report, which is not, does it not make it to the HTML after using parameter? Yeah, so there is, it doesn't make it to the HTML report. If you filter it out in the first chunks, so all of the data gets read in to a certain extent, um, and it, you can filter that out in, in like the initial chunks, and then it doesn't get anywhere else into the the data flow. Um, and this is this some some part of this I'm going to talk about right now, um, in the sense that like you can do your wrangling um, beforehand, and you can build. Um, Uh, functions inside of your um, R script, which will kind of like take, like kind of solve some of this problem I think that you're talking about or potential problem, right? Like if I have like a data leakage, for example, um, like could some teams end up being in other teams on accident just because of issues? Then theoretically, yes, that could happen, right? But that's something that, you know, somebody would probably let you know, hopefully. Um, if, if, if it's filtered correctly, then the likelihood of that happening is very, very low, but it is always a possibility if that, if that makes sense. But we're, we'll talk a little bit about that right now. So um, yeah, I just wanted to walk through, like if I was starting a report from scratch, um, what would that look like? Well, first of all, okay, I have my R, my R script. Um, cool, great. I'm just gonna read in my data, or excuse me, I'm gonna load up my libraries. So again, like I talked about before, um, I always like to use Pac-Man um, just because if I'm sharing documents or something, so using this pboot function, it gives me this. Oh, yeah, sorry. Using this pboot function, it gives me this like little snippet of code, right? And this is if uh, required Pacman is is false, right? Then it'll install. Else we load it. And so this is like a really simple way of loading in Pacman. Um, if it, so if I'm sharing this and somebody doesn't have Pac-Man installed, then it'll install Pac-Man for them. And from there, I can use this pload function, uh, which will check to see if all my packages are installed. If they're installed, it'll load them. If it's not installed, it'll install it and then load it, uh, which is really, really good. So we're going to load in my tidyverse. I'm going to load in my loop today. I'm going to load in my read Excel. And uh, just in case, I'll load in my uh, write XLSX. Or maybe it's Red Excel actually. Yeah, I think it's Red Excel. So. Yeah, there you go. Red Excel. So. Cool. And everybody should have all this stuff installed already and everything. So there shouldn't be any issues. Cool. So now I've loaded in my data. And uh, what we want to do from here is we want to pull in our data sets, right? Obviously. So 99% of the time, I'm using SQL to pull in data. Um, because we, would you guys like to see how I would do that? Would that be helpful? Um, I, it's not like planned in the workshop, but I can do it if that would be useful to someone. Um, obviously, it's not going to work because I'm not connected to my SQL server. Uh, but just theoretically, okay. So um, something else that we're going to add up here. Uh, is our ODBC. And so our ODBC is a package and this is gonna need to get installed. This was something I was planning on. 
<clears throat> RODBC is a package that connects um, your R to your SQL. And um, inside of this RODBC package, once that loads, give it a second. Uh, we have this. I just forget. Uh, oh, oh, there we go. OBDC driver connect. And so this is where you like connect your actual um, thing, uh, your connect your SQL to your R. So if we just do question mark OBDC driver connect. All right, so you have your connection. Um, let me stop. Hold on, bear with me one second while I just, I'm just gonna pull a random thing from here. Um, just so I'm not, I'm not telling any lies. I'd rather make sure that it's correct. Yeah, what was that? Okay, cool. So with that OBDC uh, driver connect, we create, a, we open a channel to our SQL server. Um, in this case, um, we have our uh, driver equals a SQL server. Uh, we have our server name, which is going to be your server name. Uh, we have uh, a database, right? So in our case, it's a reporting database, and we have a trusted connection. So if you're uh, logged into like your VPN or et cetera, then you're, if your trusted connection is true, then it will automatically connect, and you won't have to like input credentials every single time or anything like that. Once we have that channel, we can run a SQL query on it, and that's like literally just SQL code. So I usually start in my SQL, my like. Um, and like here, right? So I start in my SQL, right? I write up everything, make sure everything's correct. And then I'll uh, just copy paste that literally into here. Um, and there are like some small things to think about when you're doing that, but I'm not gonna get into that. That's not the purpose of this workshop. Um, but then, you know, I might um, create like an end date and a start date, um, like objects that, I use to like automate my report even further. So I don't have to change like the end date and the start date, kind of like how you create maybe like an end date or start date uh, uh, variable in your SQL, like with the at symbol, for example, uh, something to that effect. So you can do something very similar in R, obviously. Um, in this case, we're not gonna do that. Uh, yeah, so we're just gonna comment this because obviously that's not gonna work. Cool. So cool. So that would be like theoretically how I would read in something from like SQL. Uh, so once that's in SQL, uh, we can do some manipulation. So first, I'm just going to quickly um, pull in our data, right? So we're going to check the data. I'm just going to use a clean version for simplicity's sake. Uh, so we're going to just do that is uh, read underscore xlsx, uh, toa underscore data dot xlsx. And we've got to make sure we're in the right folder, which we weren't. Now we are. Let me just clean all the objects now. So we have to clean objects. Okay, cool. So we have that, right? And then we have like, you know, our data set, just like we did before, really, really simple. Um, nothing too crazy there. Cool. So now I want to create an object. I want to do something. I want to build a graph. I want to make a table, blah, blah, blah. Great. So I'm just going to come in here for simplicity's sake again. Just gonna go to our exercises. I'm going to go to our uh, parameterized report. I'm just going to pull a challenge from here. Great. So I, I read in our data, right? We have our data in our environment. Now I'm just going to run this. Cool. That generates like a really nice graphic, right? Great. I'm just going to create an object. So if you see now, Whenever I run this, nothing shows up here. And the reason for that is, is because I'm, 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 I'm putting it into something. I'm putting it like a box, right? I'm not actually like creating, I'm creating the graphic and then I'm putting it in a box. Once that box is built, what I can do is I can populate my RMD with the things inside of my box. So I can come over here and I can say my graphic, right? Which is interesting because if you see here, like there's nothing here, is there? And like, like I was talking about before, like our markdown is very like sequential, very logical, right? The things that happen at the top have to lead down to the things at the bottom. But here, there's like there's nothing above this. So 
in theory, like this shouldn't work, right? Well, uh, surprise, surprise, if we run our markdown uh, render, right? And if we run uh, sequential automation markdown RMD, that, pretty sure that's right. Yeah. Uh, um, exercises. Oh, look at that. It created something. Let's look at the HTML. What? No way. Oh my goodness. It, it built the graphic, even though there was literally nothing in our markdown. Well, that's really interesting. Well, that kind of unlocks a lot of doors because we can do a lot of development in our, our scripts. Um, and, you know, like Chris was saying, he prefers, um, uh, what was it? Something over something. Um, uh, something with a D, something over convenience. Can we remember? Um, anyways, I think this is really convenient. And if you know how to use it, oh, discipline. Yes, thank you, Jamie. He prefers discipline over convenience. Uh, I'm gonna be honest, I'm more of a convenience type man. Uh, so I, I prefer convenience over discipline just because I would hope that, you know, I wouldn't break anything. But if I do, I can probably figure out how to fix it. Um, but yeah, so most people would frown upon something like this. But I think something like this is really beautiful. Because now, instead of opening my R markdown, so let's say, you know, I've, I've done all this, I've, you know, I've built my, my graphics, I've built my tables and stuff. Now, instead of having to like put things into places and make sure everything's like sequenced correctly and stuff, I can just worry about formatting my R markdown, adding my commentary, making sure that um, I'm doing like, if I want to add my inline coding, I don't have to worry about like a lot of the tidbit that type work um, that can come with R markdown if you're doing development in it. Um, which can free up a lot of time, which is like the whole purpose of this workshop, right? Um, so now all I have to do is like kind of my, my easy formatting, so like adding headers, if I want tabs, um, et cetera, et cetera, so on and so forth. Um, you know, messing with like the chunk width and stuff and blah, 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 messing with the YAML if I want to add table of contents. So it's literally more like actual R markdown work instead of doing kind of uh, development actually in R markdown. Um, so, so cool. So that worked really, really well. And we, you know, we can do the same thing with like parameterized reports. We can add like parameters there. We can run multiple reports, right. With the loops that we just learned. Um, and so that, you know, that, that gets really, really cool and really efficient. So once we're at this point, we really, once we built like a report that we're happy with, we can just X out of this. And honestly, we don't ever have to look at it again, unless we're adding something or removing something because now with control shift enter, It'll start from the top of this um, of this R script, right? So you see here, I sourced, I ran source, which is the the shortcut for uh, uh, the shortcut for source, which is like running the actual like the whole thing is uh, Control Shift Enter. Uh, and so if you see here in my console, it says like if blah 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 blah. Oh, wait, did my payload? I ran, I literally ran everything in my R script, and in the end, I had this beautiful little render function that rendered my R markdown report. And since I'm already happy with all of the, the, like the output or like the, the actual like formatting of the R markdown report, and I'm happy with where everything's going, I don't actually ever have to touch that again. Um, so yeah, it's just like a very robust way of like an exam or very robust example of what maybe like a typical uh, R markdown uh, or creating an R markdown report for, for me might look like. Um, but again, there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing development in your R markdown files. Um, the reason I do it this way is again, um, like a step above this is creating like a dot batch file, which will actually, so I have to like, right now I have to open up this and I have to click uh, control shift enter. If I created a dot batch file and then, um, which essentially runs my R markdown, or not my R markdown, excuse me, which runs my R script for me, um, then I can uh, set that up in like task scheduler and then it'll run automatically at a certain time every week or a certain time every day or a certain time every month, uh, which is like even you know a step above having to open and stuff. And then obviously if I want to rename something like this, then all of that can be done in our, in our render function, which is like another thing that makes it like really, really nice because again, we don't have to touch any of that. We don't have to do uh, like the whole knit with params or anything like that. We can just do everything in our R script, 
render our R markdown and make sure that everything is in tip top shape and uh, completely uniform moving forward. Um, awesome. That is uh, all the material that I wanted to cover. Um, so maybe we'll take a quick second to do some questions and then we'll take maybe a 15 minute break. And then um, after that 15 minute break, we'll come back and we'll do some demos and that will give me enough time to kind of maybe try to set a few more things up than I had planned. Does that sound good to everyone? Does anybody have any questions? We have these RMD templates. I, I have, um, are you talking about um, like this? Yeah, so there are some packages, one of which we'll talk about that is built from templates like Sharing Gun, which is a, a package to do like RMD PowerPoints. Um, so that one's like a really, really cool one. Um, there are a lot of other ones that I've done from template like Flex Dashboard is another one that you can do from template, which builds like a dashboard using RMD. So um, no, I'm going to get too much into it. We're going to do like a quick demo. Maybe we can showcase some of those things. Maybe, maybe go to like the actual like repository for those things. because I don't have all of them like offhand, but we can talk about a lot of stuff like that. Uh, so I'll show off some of the stuff that I've done. Um, and then uh, after we've run out of that stuff to talk about, uh, we can go and like maybe do like a group search while we tread through all of like the really cool stuff that other people have done. Um, if that makes sense. Does that help? Is that kind of what you're asking, Wayne? Awesome, great. So any other questions? Nope, okay, awesome. Let's take a 15 minute break then guys, and we'll come back at uh, around 2.32, okay? And I'm just gonna quickly turn off my camera and, and uh, take get some water and stuff. So I'll be right back.
everybody. I am back in case anybody has any questions before we uh, continue on. Um, so we're going to start here in the next, here at 32 or so. But if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask them because I am back. Um, yeah, Tina, so that's a good point. Um, it does, but I'm relatively certain that you would still have similar issues. The reason that we have to navigate through directories, um, so you see here, this, this is also based off of a project. I don't know if you can see my cursor here. It has this template.r project. So we're also using a project. The reason we're having to go through directories is because um, the RMD files that we've been using haven't been in like the actual project, like base project directory. So if it was in the base project directory, um, then yeah, we, there wouldn't be any issues whatsoever. But because we're inside of a folder, which is inside of our project directory, right? Then we have to come out to reach the project directory and then we have to look into it. Um, I am relatively certain that's the only way um, there might be a way um, at the beginning of every RMD file, if you were to like set up your option to auto um, auto set your uh, your directory, for example. Um, then that might work. Um, and then that could solve that issue. Uh, yeah, so you could use the here function uh, or you could use um, just like, for example, if we go to exercises, um, you can use like this uh, set root directory here, this function, uh, which is from the knitter package. Something that effect. Oops, here. I don't remember what package here is in. I think it's in like knitter or something.
Ah. Yeah, that's probably a good point. Yeah, I don't have the here package installed. So, um, but yes, I, I believe you're correct. Um, you could use the here function, which would uh, set always set your uh, your directory as the base project. If I'm I'm pretty sure that's correct, um, but I'd have to look at it. That sounds right. So yeah, cool. Okay. Uh, time to get back, everyone. Um, hopefully, everybody's kind of shuffling back in. Uh, so, Chris just messaged me uh, saying that something else we could also use a different function in our um, in our where's it at? Sorry, I lost it, everyone. Okay, so we can close everything now. Uh, we're basically done with all the um, all of the the like functionality, like type stuff. And we're, we're basically done with mostly everything. Um, so I guess, I guess it's really up to you guys um, what we want to do. So we can either uh, end a little bit early, we can go over some demo stuff. Like I don't have a lot of demo stuff just because it's the first time I've done the workshop. Um, so it's probably lacking quite a bit to be honest, uh, but we can kind of go over like some stuff that's on like our gallery. Good question. Do you circulate reports as HTML documents like as emails or attachments in Word reports, or do you use PDF for that? I always attach HTML reports. Uh, so I, yeah, HTML docs. So I just um, run a report and then have an uh, output as a uh, HTML. And then once the output is HTML, I just uh, go into the file directory or obviously it's like email, um, you know, attachment, and then I just attach the HTML file. Um, so it, it actually, in, in most cases, depending on what you're trying to do, might might be better to do it with HTML than PDF or Word. Um, so with that in mind, um, yeah, what do we want to do? Do we want to end a bit early? Do we want to do some demo? Um, do we want to maybe run through another example, if that's useful? Um, what do we think? What do we think? Um, is there anything, some demos? Okay, we can do some demos. Is there anything that I haven't covered that you were really hoping that I would have? There's always those things where you like tables. I've used cable um, to insert tables. Is that right? Yeah, so tables, um, you can absolutely use cable um, and cable extra to build some really nice like tables, uh, which I, I do that very, very often. Pivot. Please, um, when you say pivot, Judy, what do you mean? Do you mean like um, like filtering data? Do you mean like is it like filtering uh, like pivot like Excel pivot like filter the data into things or pivot long and wide filtering or ah. Okay, let's see. The whole publishing of our markdown, especially what does it mean in terms of data security when we publish on HTML? So because, okay, let me answer some, let me do um, Romanus's question and then uh, we'll start with the demos. And then while we're doing the demos, we'll talk about maybe cable and then um, maybe we'll do like another small example and we'll talk about like pivot long and wide and stuff like that. So uh, Judy, if you want like a quick little example of how to do pivots, I do um, some pivots in the data prep um, to clean up the time of access data. So if you take a look at that, I do, or I'll just pull it up right now actually. Uh, I do this pivot here to pivot longer. Um, so you can take a look at kind of that and try to break that down. Um, and then there's also like a really nice little filter function as well in case you need to figure out how to do that. So it's all there. Really cool. Great. Glad I could help. Uh, no worries. So yeah, um, let's see. So cable, I've, yes, I've used cable many, many times. Really, really good package. Um, and we can go over that in the demo. So uh, the whole publishing of our markdown, this is like a really interesting concept. Uh, especially what does it mean in terms of like data security when we publish on HTML? So when you create these reports, you're creating local versions, right? It doesn't go anywhere. So you, you aren't, you, it's not like live web pages, 
nothing like that. So they're all like um, protected by like your machine's protection, right? Like if you were to create any other type of file, like a PDF file or a Word file, uh, so on and so forth. And as you share them, it shares just like you would any other file, like a PDF or a Word or whatever. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, there isn't any issues with data security. Now, if you were to want to publish out to a server, um, that would involve maybe like your IT team uh, making sure that the first of all, the server was set up correctly and they had all the protections around the server. And then those documents would live on that server under those protections. Um, but I don't, I've never had uh, any issues with or encountered any issues with uh, generating our markdown reports and having any sort of like, um, like data privacy protection issues at all. So does that answer that question? I think it does. Um, so yeah, so no issues with data security when we publish to HTML. Uh, Thank you. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. No yes. worries. Okay, cool. Let's do some demos. Um, nice. So Um, okay, another question. When we do the demos, do we want to look at like the source code? Do we want to look at just the output, like what we can do? Um, or do we want to look at like both of them? Up to you guys. Yes, no, maybe source code. Vicky says source code. Okay. Uh, okay, let's do that then. Um, um, okay, I don't actually have the source code for some of these, for some of this stuff. Um, so I'm just going to do it on my personal R Studio. Uh, let's see, projects. Okay. So this is one where I did so like a lot of the development work. Um, hold on, let me make this bigger because you probably you guys probably can't see that whatsoever, can you? Uh, appearance. Where is, where's it at? Where's it at? Appearance. Zoom um, it's been up to like 125, yeah. How's that? Is that better? Thumbs up if that's better. Yeah. I rolled I rolled dark mode. That's just kind of how I do my R Studio. Um, but yeah, everybody has their preferences. Cool. So um, <clears throat> because I know this is something that nobody else is ever going to touch, uh, this is like a special modeling kind of like one-off project that I did. So the first thing that I did, like I showed before, I read in my libraries. Uh, I read in my data. So this is like the time of access data that we were playing with as well. Uh, so I did like some data, just like checking. So checking the Excel sheets, um, uh, reading, you know, reading in the data. Then I did a pivot longer, um, some filtering, some stuff like that. Um, and then I did some like statistics, um, generated some random distributions. Um, and that ended up leading to I kind of want to pull these side by side. Hold on. Is that is that better? So you can kind of get an idea. Okay. So this is. The, um, yeah, so this is like this report output, right? So um, really simple YAML. Like I said, I just kind of use like a base one. So I always have like table of contents and the float. Um, so I didn't do a lot of manipulation on this. I think it's relatively straightforward. Um, so you can also use like dashes to do lists. Um, like we did uh, bullets or we did asterisks and numbers, um, but you can also do like dashes as well, which is cool. Uh, so then, you know, I have some like bolds here. I have the header. Um, I load in all of my uh, packages in the first chunk, and then I set it equal to uh, echo equal to false, right? So I don't see any of like the code bits. Um, so this is one where I did my development inside of my uh, my actual report. So like I said, you know, I prefer to do it one way, but that doesn't mean that I always do it one way. Um, 
I did it this way just because it was like a one-off. So this is kind of like the backbones of all of this. And um, this R script doesn't actually populate my RMD. It's just a way for me to, oh, I might be lying actually. I think it does. Oh, wait, never mind. No, this is something completely different. Sorry. Um, so this is like my backend model as well as like some just playing around with things and making sure that they work. Um, I can probably share this to be honest. Would you guys, would you guys want this? I can share it. I can upload this to the, uh, to the GitHub repository and then you guys can look at it if you want to look more in depth as to like what's going on. Um, just cause there's, there's quite a bit in here. Um, yeah, cool. Okay. I can do that. Yeah. There's nothing private in here. So cool. Okay. So this is, um, to, I guess even more background. So essentially what I did was I built a simulation for, um, the first response, uh, crisis service, um, for the DPT. And, um, so the, the top bit is like just kind of data cleaning and exploring um, for the different types of like um, pathways that a patient could come into the crisis service. So the top one is like a self-referral type pathway. And the, the second one is like professional type pathway. And then um, after all of that, I did, I used Simmer to do um, a, like an actual simulation of the call center. Uh, and that's based off of like uh, resources that we define and um, times and stuff like a bunch of a bunch of information and blah 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 stuff like that, uh, and that's kind of like all of this um, probably from <clears throat> from here down, basically from possible final simmer down. I think I don't remember. I didn't really code. I didn't really comment this very well. I can't tell. Uh, but it's because, like I said, nobody else was ever going to look at it until now. So there you go. Maybe I need to go back and comment this. Uh, but yeah, so once I did all that, I kind of got an idea of like everything, built the whole picture in my R script. And then I came over to my RMD and said, okay, um, now I need to like actually write the report. So like, you know, I, I had like a little introductions, like what a simulation is if you go up to a clinician and you're like, I built a simulation. They're like, I don't know what the heck that means. Um, so like I, you know, explained what a simulation was and like the whole like background of the situation. And then we did some cool stuff. So this is a package called Plotly. Has anybody played with Plotly before? Uh, Tina, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, so a really simple. Um, yeah, so I really, I really did my development in here. It, this is one code chunk, guys. Um, why did I do that? Yeah, so I did all of my data wrangling in one single chunk. And then from there, I just saved all of the objects. So you see here, like this sim lead scatter, this is all one uh, like gplot. And then from there, I just used this function ggplotly, which creates uh, a plotly graphic out of a ggplot graphic. Um, I'm not gonna run this because it'll probably take a while. But uh, yeah, so once I created all of my objects, so I basically like, you know how I was saying before, um, you know, it, you can use an R script to create all your objects and then, you know, just to put that into an RMD and then just render type thing. So I did something similar, except not exactly the same in the sense that I created all of my objects in like the first chunk. And then from there, I just like populated all of my subsequent chunks with the objects in the first one. Does that make sense? Um, so you can like, there's so many different ways you can do this. Uh, and it really depends on your personal preference and how you like to do things. Um, if I was to go back and like redo this, I think I would take this huge code chunk out and put it into an R, like a separate R script. And then uh, just because it would be like, like this is a lot to look at, let's be honest, right? Like this is a bit much um, to have like in a single chunk in the middle of a report. And so like, if you were looking at the code for this, you'd be like, I don't know, I don't know why this is here. Um, Cause that's kind of how I just looked at it right now. Um, so yeah, I would probably take this out and maybe like move it over to a separate R script and then just kind of, yeah, do the, do the whole render deal um, and, and pull that information in. Uh, but yeah, so basically I built all my objects in that chunk and then I just use like this really simple GG plotly um, to build that. And so, like I said, uh, this generates um, an interactive graph. So if I didn't use this GG plotly and I just called sim scatter, this would be the exact same plot, except it wouldn't hover like this. So this is like kind of the cool functionality that, plot, that plotly has. 
is that you can do kind of like hovers. Um, so you can do like, then you can do like day by day comparisons, stuff like that. Uh, you can um, zoom in to specific, uh, more specific days, or you can, uh, yeah, do, do like little hovers or like single hovers or double hovers. You can um, unmap certain uh, lines. So you, if you want to like, just look at like the real data, uh, then you can do that. Or if you want to like, just look at the simulated data, you can do that. Uh, so that's really cool. Um, this is again, uh, Plotly uh, in, in, in our markdown. Same deal, except with box plot distributions, um, et cetera, et cetera. This is just an image here, or is it an image? Might not be actually. Oh yeah, so this is like the actual, um, yeah, so this is like a plot function that kind of explains the process of the actual simulation. I have some like more uh, writing up here, um, which the ES model, how does it work? And kind of like some things in bold to like, you know, I have a bit of like, an N here, right? A little bit of inline coding there. Um, so yeah, just relatively like some, some pretty cool, simple stuff. Uh, not like, it, well, not simple, like what I did was simple, but simple in the sense of like building the RMD wasn't that, uh, wasn't that involved. Um, again, just like some simple graphics and, uh, you know, some, just some, some stuff, you know, stuff in italics. Uh, yeah, so on and so forth. Um, yeah, so a lot of, you know, whatever it might be. Does that, yeah, so then, and, you know, this is like another plotly graph that's like a bit simpler. I'm just, I think I got, I got a bit lazy to be honest and was like, I'm kind of done with this because uh, it's a bit of work. So uh, yeah, so, you know, just some, some good stuff overall. Um, just kind of exactly what I, what I taught you guys today, just using a lot of the functionality of, of, of what we, would love to have the code for that. Yeah, definitely. Can you definitely get that to you? No worries whatsoever. Um, so yeah, you know, just really, really simple stuff in terms of like the actual RMD. Obviously, the the script that builds all of this stuff is a, like a bit more involved. Um, not too much, to be honest. Um, and there's like a very specific reason as to why that is, um, which I'm not going to get into right now. But um, yeah, just like a really simple kind of like our markdown format though, like very simple layout. The YAML is really simple. Um, just using like italics and uh, my headers effectively uh, learning, you know, where to put things and where to put commentary. Um, so like, you know, where to add in that extra information to make the report kind of uh, yeah, a bit more, a bit more uh, uh, intuitive and a bit more like, you know, for example, like, what does this mean as like a sub sub header? What does this not mean? And, and you know, not in bold and things like that, you know? It's a lot of the good stuff, a lot of the good stuff. Cool. So that's one um, where I did it that way. Let's look at a different one. Um, let's look at, I might've moved this already. Let's see if it's still here. So this is the uh, police and ambulance referrals. Again, something that I showed this morning. Um, and so this is the R script that generates an RMD. So this is like what I was talking about today. Here we have like some HTML, like Tina was asking about today. So we have some HTML stuff where we change the, the color of some words. Like here, for example, we have uh, we change the color of police to blue, and we change the color of ambulance to red, for example, or to fire brick, excuse me. Uh, but here in the actual like code chunks, all we have is like these small functions that we've built. And where do we build that? Well, we built them over here in our R script. Um, so this is cool. We have like our title, author, output. We don't have a date, right? Uh, well, the reason is because we have ju we just removed it and added these little period sections. So the period is from and this is inline code, right? So our start date to our end date, and it was last run on our today. Um, so we removed the date altogether from the YAML, and we just used some inline code to populate our start and end dates, like the periods that we're looking at, and then also to to look at our, um, you know, our last uh, our last run date, which was uh, yesterday, quote unquote yesterday. Uh, so yeah, pretty cool. Um, so let's look at the actual code for this. So like I said, um, usually I'll like pull in um, 
stuff from SQL, which is what I did here, right? I have my, my little SQL query. Um, this report was 100% automated in the sense that I, I made the bat file and I put that into task scheduler. Um, and so I didn't actually have to touch this until recently because um, I'm actually leaving the NHS. Um, so the, obviously there are people who might get confused by something like this because they just don't know how it works. Um, so I removed um, some of the emailing functionality. So I, I automated like sending out the email and you can do that using this um, uh, RDCom client, which is really cool. Um, and so if you want, you can take a, a look into that. I'll just kind of copy paste the package. So you can use this package to like automate emails. Um, image plot when using Markdown with Word documents is okay for in various settings. Uh, yes, Vicky, that is exactly what it is. Um, that is absolutely exactly what it is. So different, um, different um, outputs will do different things when you input the same parameters or the same like arguments. So if like a figure width for of 10 in an HTML output might look really good. And if you do that in Word, it might like do something really strange. And also kind of how like Word works, just like in creating different pages. Sometimes if you make a figure too big, it will um, kind of like move it down to a separate page or something um, just because of how like page breaks work. Um, also, if like it gets too wide, it's going to do something really funky. Um, and I think the default is to put the image on like the image alignment on the right. Um, but it might be a better idea if you're doing it Word to like do the image alignment in the, in the center. So a lot of stuff like that. So it is really just like playing with the formatting and if you get a format that you really like, then maybe you can uh, like copy paste that into a text file. Um, and then you can just like, whenever you make a Word document and you want to output that way, you can just kind of copy paste it into your code chunks and you don't have to worry about it. Or you can set it as like a global options um, using uh, this options, this knitter uh, OPTS underscore chunk uh, dollar set. And that'll check, uh, that'll, um, set all of the uh, chunks as these uh, parameters. So, you know, if I wanted to come in here and do like comma uh, fig dot with equals whatever, then it'll apply that to all of the chunks. So if I have like a standard kind of idea of what I want everything to be, then I can, you know, just put that into like one of these and then that'll apply to everything. And I think this shows up as default whenever you create a new RMD. So you don't actually have to remember how to do this. You just have to remember or create a little text file of all of the arguments or all of the little like specific specific things that you want to do in each one. Uh, yeah. So, anyways, um, so this is this was really cool. Um, this is really really cool uh, doing this. So yeah, I read in my SQL file. Um, I do some like date manipulation, um, strip the date a bit, and kind of like reformat it. Um, just because there were some issues and I do some like data wrangling and there was like some really specific work that I had to do around uh, like I did like a really interesting pivot uh, here and then that I had to get like a column for every single day but if there weren't any referrals on a given day then that column obviously wouldn't appear um, so I had to do some like interesting finagling which is kind of what happens here to to get it so that every column appeared even if there was nothing there um, and yeah, so once I've done, once I did all that, I, um, tested it all and then I built some functions. So I built this full table function. Um, so I created the objects, right? So this is like the ambulance percentage, uh, which is this bottom table here. Uh, this is like the, uh, popo percentage, uh, uh, which is the table down here and stuff. Um, so yeah, so once that, once I was there, I was like, okay, I know I want these tables to be exactly the same. Um, so there's gonna be literally no difference because they should all be, they won't be the same like row length, but they should be the same column length because they all contain the same information. Seven days plus the information around um, the referral, right? So I kind of did some finagling and built a function that would um, using just the data that was input into it would return a table relative to, um, relative to, uh, you know, the, the population of interest, the police or ambulance. And so once I had built those functions, um, I could just use full that function full table, which was you know defined here, and then input like my police data set. 
or I could do my, my perk data set and, and do my police, my police percentage data set. Use full table, use ambulance, and then again with ambulance percentage. And I use this using a uh, flex table, uh, which is this package here, in case anybody wants to look at it. Uh, really, really cool package uh, to make some like really nice uh, reactive um, tables. So like this is like a heat map on these seven or these seven. Um, uh, these, well, this is a heat map on all of the, the dates, right? So if there's more dates, then there's more heat maps, obviously, so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. Um, yeah, and I can supply the data or the, the thing, the code for this as well, um, just because it's not, again, it's not super, it's not confidential at all, to be honest. Um, but yeah, cool. Is that pretty cool. Um, okay, I have some other stuff to show you around PowerPoints. We'll come out of the examples now. We'll go into our demo. Um, come back to here. Projects, FRS2A, uh, RMD. This is, again, the same. Um, like simulation thing that I was talking about earlier, except in, oh man, that's not what I wanted to do. Yeah, so this is the same. Um, uh, um, the same thing I was showing earlier, except with um, in a PowerPoint. So this is a um, our markdown PowerPoint instead of a uh, instead of a, like an actual report. Um, and this is the code for that. Um, all relatively straightforward. Um, it uses like literally the same syntax. Basically, um, you create a new like slide using like headers. So every new header is like a new slide. Um, you know, and then you know, can shift through that and you can have like your interactive, um, your interactive, uh, what's it called? Graphs, I don't know why I just blanked on that word, inside of your PowerPoint, which is really kind of cool. Um, stuff like that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so on and so forth. Um, it can get kind of fidgety, like with stuff like this. It's like, I have a lot of information here um, and like some of it's going off the page. Um, I mean, I know you can fix this if you create like you can you can create a PowerPoint and then use that as like the skeleton for your RMD PowerPoint and it'll follow like the same formatting. So if I knew where this was in like my uh, my skeleton PowerPoint, then I could change like the size of the of the of the words, for example, or I could even do that in my markdown actually. So like change the font for example, change the font size, I guess I should say. To make it smaller so that way it fits on the page. Uh, but I didn't do that because it was kind of like a one-off thing. Um, and I didn't actually show this to anyone. So you guys are the first ones that are seeing it. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, so then you have like results and you know, da -da -da -da, so on and so forth again. Um, that one doesn't have a GG plotly around it, but it's the same principle, like a really simple like table with nothing around it. What does this mean? What does this not mean? Comments. So yeah, like a really simple kind of like HTML. This is an HTML PowerPoint. Uh, I believed I use, if you go to our markdown and you create, if you use from presentation, I think I used IO slides. Um, relatively certain I used IO slides. But yeah, so it's something you can also use, like do like a PDF PowerPoint. So if you do a PDF PowerPoint though, you can't have um, like interactive graphics, right? Because PDF is static. Um, which uh, is in some cases really good. I know like a lot of clinicians um, that I work with I send them reports with like interactive graphics and they end up just like printing off my HTML page, like doing a control P on the page. And then like, well, that was kind of a waste, wasn't it? But I like to do, you know, things that if somebody was looking at it online that they could kind of mess with it and touch it and stuff. Uh, meanwhile here, obviously if they print, they won't be able to like see values or anything like that. So there's like pros and cons. Um, and I guess it depends on who you're working with and what they're trying to do, and what you're trying to do with the data. Yeah, just really kind of dependent on what you're trying to do basically, so. Cool. Okay, so that's that.
Okay, so this, um, moving kind of away from my stuff, well, this is still my stuff, but uh, this is kind of a side thing. So let's say, let's imagine that we have like 20 teams, which I know is possible, right? Like if you have like clinical mental health teams or, or whatever, or if you have um, like just different teams within departments or you have multiple departments and within those departments you have different teams um you have like a lot of uh like groups and subgroups that and so you want to do like kind of like a dashboard type thing so this is my take on that so how i did this was i built these functions called my plot and my lm and then a function for making tabs and so this is like raw rmd coding um, so imagine instead of like creating an R markdown document and um, like doing all the formatting and putting things into it, instead I straight from the R script built the entire RMD file. So here you have like the YAML um, and some like some tabs, right? And some tab sets. Then you have like an R chunk here. So I, I literally built the R script and then I populate that using like the functions. So whenever this is run, um, it'll then render like the thing hopefully if it works where do you go oh it's right here okay um so yeah i created this file to knit rmd and then we can kind of take a look at it so here we see like from scratch from the actual r script we can generate an rmd if we like hard code it literally um, and so then we see like here we have like empty cars and iris so let's like imagine you have like 20 different teams, right? And so if you want to build one R markdown report, um, like you'd have to like create 20 different tabs and then you'd have to go through each one and then um, like create like all the data structures for it and then input that into one and then copy paste into a bunch of them. Um, so it's like, you know, before we're talking about, um, you know, creating one RMD file for each team, right? But this is like creating one tab for each team within an RMD file. Um, and there's most likely like 99.9% .9 likely that there's an easier way to do this. I just haven't figured it out. So if somebody wants to do something like this and figure it out, they're more than happy to. Uh, I'm more than happy to uh, learn from them because they'd be amazing because that, you know, it's something that could be really useful to people. Um, yeah, so for example, here we have like two really common data sets in R, which like empty cars and iris. So let's say this is like team one, team two, you know, we can get all the information from, you know, uh, team one into one, one, um, one tab and then another tab. And then we could do like a dashboard. Um, so now we're kind of, that's basically the end of what I have. Um, so we can kind of look at some flex board, flex dashboard examples. Um, that's a good one to look at. So this is Flex Dashboard. Have you guys ever seen Flex Dashboard before? Um, this is one of those template things that, um, that Wayne was talking about. Um, it's relatively straightforward. Um, you just kind of go to R Markdown, uh, uh, you know, create a thing. You have to have, R, uh, you have, to have uh, Flex Dashboard installed. Um, in this case, since we're not obviously doing it in this workshop, I don't have Flex Dashboard installed. But if ever were come today where I would build like a like an advanced intro to R Markdown, this might be the place to do that kind of thing, where we would maybe like explore doing uh, like PowerPoint uh, exporting um, PDF exporting um, Word exporting, um, uh, yeah, Flex dashboard, some like the the more common ones. Um, so yeah, so you know this is like, so it kind of has like the same feel of of our markdown, except it's it's like, it's a dashboard, right? And it's called flex dashboards, that makes sense, right? Um, so, you know, you have like the tabs here. So it's the same functionality, really. Uh, you have some hyperlinks here, like some additional functionality with that. Um, this is just like Plotly, right? So you can see up here, um, produced with Plotly. So these are all Plotly graphs. So you can do the exact same thing in in, uh, in our markdown, just like with a regular markdown report, but this one just looks more kind of dash, it has it more like a dashboard feel, uh, you know? so. So yeah, that's kind of like some stuff you can do with that. Um, oops, didn't mean to do that. Um, what else? What else have I not covered that you guys are like, oh, I want to look at that? 
Um, anything else? Oh, let me add a flex dashboard. Is there anything else that we can think of? If not, I think we're gonna end a bit early, probably, um, just because there's not much else. Oh, no, let's go on to more advanced topics, which I don't think this workshop is. That's not the purpose of this workshop, so I don't think we're gonna do that. So um, I will say, uh, example table from scratch. Uh, oh, when you say table, do you mean like a flex table or do you mean like a, like a cable? Where will we find the links for the R Markdown file? Okay, so good question. So let me cover this quickly before either whichever is more basic. Uh, definitely a cable, so we'll do that quickly. But um, so for this workshop, I want to thank everybody for coming. We'll answer some of these other questions as well. And as more questions come in, we can spend time answering those as well. Um, so this workshop is located on the NHSR GitHub repository. So you can go into the GitHub repository and look at everything that we've done here. Okay. So uh, the entire day we've been working through this, um, this like exercises folder, um, but all the solutions or my solutions are on the actual, like in the solutions folder. Um, and I believe that this specific space that you guys have created is yours. So if you created a project, uh, you should be working in your own project and you can come back to that project. So save the link um, and you can come back to your project and look at what you've done, look at the solutions, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but like I said, let me quickly, uh, let, get, let me get the, the get, with the help to get the GitHub repository so you guys knew where it was. Um, doo -doo. Uh, here is the GitHub repository. What about the extra ones that you demoed? Um, I will update the repository. Um, with the source code and everything. And that should be in maybe, if not tonight, it'll be there maybe tomorrow. Um, so then we can look at that um, or anybody can look at that. Um, yes, so um, cool. And like I said, all the solutions are there and there shouldn't be any issues with that. Um, if you do find an issue or an error, please let me know. And then I can go into it and fix it. And then there won't be any errors anymore, which is good, obviously. Um, thank you, Andrew. Much appreciated. Thank you, Susan. Um, we'll quickly just do a uh, a table for Jamie. So we're just gonna um, maybe just do. We're actually just gonna do a pander. Um, um, just because that's probably the easiest thing. Uh, let's see, where should we put it? Uh, okay, so we're just gonna do a quick little thing here. And let's throw in this library read Excel. Let's throw in this library pander. So if you don't have pander installed, yeah, you can install it, you can follow along if you'd like. Um, and then we're just going to do like a really quick filter. We should do like a group by. Our start and months, um, and then we'll just do a summarize with a, with a sum, just like literally like we've been doing basically all day. Well, so we have that, and it comes up with that, right? Uh, 96 rows looks pretty good. Um, uh, and then we can throw that in like a table, maybe. Um, yeah, so that's pretty long. Um, uh, we can throw that in a pander. So then when we knit this, oh, I'll start with tidyverse. We're using tidyverse functions, aren't we? So this pander creates um, a pandoc table, and this is probably like 
the simplest version. Um, so it gets something like this, for example. Um, obviously not very pretty and definitely not what we're trying to do, but it gives you an idea, like that's a pretty, I say, I say nice table. It's not a nice table, but um, you can do like a really simple table, I suppose. Um, maybe it'd be better just to do that actually. That probably look better. Uh, thank you, Shama. Much appreciated. Uh, glad it's been helpful. Yeah, that looks better. Yeah, so something like that, right? So our start and all of that jazz. Does that help, Jamie? So you can use Pander. Uh, you can use Cable, which has like literally the exact same, um, literally the exact same um, syntax. So instead of Pander, you just do like Cable there, um, and that would create a, like a cable table. Um, yeah, so that's that's the end of the workshop, guys. Much appreciated, everyone. Um, I hope that was helpful. I hope um, you can take away a lot from this workshop. I hope that this workshop is going to help you save a lot of time um, just in your like regular reporting and kind of like getting through a lot of the dross of the day to day, um, just freeing up a lot of your time and, and, is, and is really useful and helpful in, um, yeah, just making your life uh, a lot easier. And uh, yeah, so thank you all so much uh, for coming. Uh, much appreciated. I'm going to stop sharing now. Um, if there are any more questions, um, feel free to uh, drop me an email or to, uh, if, is everybody on, if anybody, if everybody's on Slack page, you can message me on Slack. Um, and if not, I'll just pop my email into the chat. Um, and you can just pop me an email if you have any questions. All right. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Stop the recording now.